Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This will be my second open-ended conversation with my friend Eben Alexander, former instructor in neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. He is author of Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife and co-authored with Karen Newell, Living in a Mindful Universe, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. Eben and Karen have also produced a CD called Seeking Heaven, Sound Journeys into the Beyond. Eben lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. I'm looking forward to a lengthy conversation today. We've actually blocked out three hours. Welcome, Evan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Well, Jeff, it's great to be back with you too. This is always a joy. So, good to be with you today. We had a great connection uh, just a few weeks ago in Vail, Colorado. Well, I thought it was fantastic and I was so glad that you were available for the Vail Symposium, because I know they've spent, uh, you know, Gary Gilman and that group have spent a lot of time over the last few years investigating deeply into consciousness. And uh, I thought you would be the, the perfect guest for them. And I'm glad we could work it out so I could be there too. It was really a wonderful session. It was. And it was at that session, uh, as we were dialoguing with each other, that I was inspired to suggest that we uh, do what we're about to do right now, which is to engage in a lengthy conversation. We've blocked out three hours just to go more deeply into things. I, I know this is our second open-ended conversation. Well, it is. And uh, for me, it's a real joy. I always uh, learn a tremendous amount uh, in discussion with you. And uh, that was certainly the case in Vail. And so I'm looking forward to this too. Let's talk about your near-death experience. And, and I want to make sure I have the timeline correct also. I think if I remember correctly, it was around 2008. Right. It was in November. Uh, I was in coma from November 10th. November 16th of 2008. At that time, uh, the medical records uh, were collected and reviewed by Bruce Grayson. I think he said there were 600 pages of medical records documenting those seven or eight days. Yeah, there. Uh, I mean, it was an extensive record. And of course, you know, initially, um, I had gone through it myself. And that's where the real mystery started, because uh, I went through this extraordinary experience that involved a complete deletion of all my earthly memories and then a two month recovery uh, afterwards. And uh, plus, to me, the more I uh, gleaned about the details of my medical situation, the more impossible the whole thing seemed to be. I mean, the two main sticking points, one was that my brain was um, demonstrably very inactivated, not only damaged throughout all lobes of my brain in the neocortex, but also even my brain stem was damaged from day one. And uh, so there was no place in that brain for any kind of dream or hallucination to occur, given what we think in modern neuroscience about the role of the uh, neocortex in formulating, you know, all the details of conscious awareness. So that was a big mystery. How could I have the most extraordinary and robust, memorable, detailed experience of my entire life when the parts of my brain that normally we would think are responsible for generating such an experience were demonstrably offline? And the other big mystery, of course, uh, for any uh, physician or healthcare professional who reviews that medical record is how in the world did I spend seven days in coma due to the severe gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis 
And, uh, you know, my doctors estimated I started that week with a 10% chance of survival. By the end of the week, it was only a 2% chance of survival, but with no chance of, of recovery of full quality of function. And that's where the doctors were recommending stopping the antibiotics and letting nature take its course. And of course, to me, when I reviewed the medical records, I was shocked by uh, my recovery because that's the piece that really gets your attention as a, as a healthcare professional. How I could come back to full function over two months is really a mystery. There are no cases like it in the literature on meningitis, but of course there are other cases um, in, in the near-death literature of people who have had profound healing after an NDE. And I think that's where the world needs to pay their attention, uh, you know, because these kind of miraculous healings uh, that are very objectively identified in, in medical science uh, are well worthy of our attention if we care at all about healing in, in, a, in a bigger sense. And so that's why I think it's so important to stress that my initial analysis, you know, as a neurosurgeon going through my own records uh, uh, share and, and going through it with my uh, doctors who took care of me, trying to come up with some answers. But we really couldn't answer any of this within the uh, conventional medical paradigm. And that is why Dr. Grayson and Dr. Serbi Khanna and Lauren Moore took it on themselves to review my medical records. And they did that eight to 10 years after my coma. And what drew them to the case was this miraculous recovery. Uh, a recovery that really has no explanation in Western medicine. And of course, for the lay public, you know, it's a big so what, because they don't necessarily understand all that. But to those of us in, in medicine and in healthcare, it's, it's really a, astonishing. And, and it offers tremendous clues about our abilities to heal uh, in general. And that's where I think uh, Bruce Grayson and team were so amazed by this case. And the one last thing I'd point out about all that is that, in fact, when um, when they these three doctors had the case report written uh, and they took it to the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease to the peer review editors submitting it for publication, those editors <clears throat> they reviewed the case and they said this is absurd. That was the word they used. That um, you know this kind of case doesn't line up. How can someone this ill with meningoencephalitis uh, end up making a full recovery? And that's where uh, Dr. Grayson and Connie and uh, uh, Dr. Moore answered, it's because he had a near-death experience. And that was good enough for the scientific peer review editors of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease say, okay, now we have a potential explanation. Yes, it's worthy of publication. But that's where people's attention needs to be drawn is the reason they published this was because it defies all of our kind of medical uh, concepts and knowledge about the brain, mind, and consciousness, and the generation of detailed conscious awareness. So uh, that's why the scientific community takes my case so seriously. Do you have any idea, Eben, how you contracted this disease? Well, we, we never did. You know, I explored in, in the book uh, Proof of Heaven how I had taken a trip to Israel uh, a few months before my coma. Uh, and that was all part of my work. I was working for the Focused Ultrasound Surgery Foundation. I was coordinating global research in this very promising technology uh, that I think in many ways is going to revolutionize uh, medicine. Um, and there was that strange case that occurred in Tel Aviv while I was there of plasma transfer between, uh, you know, Klebsiella pneumonia uh, bacterium. And I go into all the details in the book and I won't go into it now. But the, the important thing to point out is we thought we might have some glimmer of an idea of how I got it. But at the end of the day, no, that wasn't the case. And so uh, my doctors, the consultants they had up and down the eastern seaboard, all agreed that there really was no explanation of how I got it. Uh, and to me, that it, 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 I've come to see that so many of these things have a much bigger purpose in life. And it's much more kind of teleological and kind of aimed at taking humanity in a given direction. And that's how I've come to see uh, this whole 
thing is is kind of a beautiful gift, a miracle. I mean, to me, you know, looking back on a week spent in coma due to a severe should have killed me bacterial meningoencephalitis. Well, to look at that with a very fond and adoring memory, like thank God for that experience. Uh, that's my my reality today. I'm very grateful for it, uh, but obviously for the tremendous gifts that it brought me, and in many ways is bringing the world at large. So. Uh, tremendous gratitude for the hardships. That's one of the lessons I've learned in in uh, my entire journey is that the hardships are often beautiful gifts. I've done a number of interviews with a fellow named R.J. Spina, who also contracted an unusual condition. Uh, his doctor diagnosed him as uh, being permanently paralyzed from the chest on down, paraplegia. And uh, in his case, he had grown up with uh, exper mystical experiences since childhood, and he believed that he contracted this disease so that he could cure himself and prove to the world that it could be done. And he did. He Now he walks normally. Uh, in your case, however, uh, you didn't have a history of mystical experiences prior to uh, this event, I, I gather. I, I really didn't. You know, I was a conventional card-toting, reductive materialist neuroscientist who kind of fully bought into the materialist position. Now, I had fought it earlier in my career because... Uh, my father had been very uh, spiritual and very scientific. He, he headed up a, a neurosurgical training program, but he had a strong belief in the power of prayer and in a, a loving personal God. And for him, there was never any conflict. Uh, you know, for me, uh, yes, there were challenges in trying to reconcile those worldviews. And as much as I wanted to believe everything I'd heard in my Methodist church growing up, Episcopal church as an adult, uh, as a practicing neurosurgeon, I just found it more and more difficult to understand how conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. And that's why, to me, it was such an incredible gift to go through this uh, experience. And in so many ways, you know, looking back on my life, this was the way it all kind of came together and made sense. Even though I never could have predicted that, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, that having an, uh, a should have killed me bacterial meningoencephalitis and then recovering from it, uh, would be part of my life journey. But of course, in looking back on it, it fits perfectly with all the events of my life. And I consider it a tremendous gift because of what it has brought to me in terms of an understanding of mind and matter and kind of soul and relationships and uh, having a, a purpose uh, and meaning to our existence. I mean, uh, from my point of view, that's the definition of spirituality. It has two ingredients. One is this notion of one mind that we're all connected. And I think the scientific evidence for that is uh, really becoming overwhelming coming out of the world of consciousness studies, that we're all truly in this together. And of course, that's a fundamental lesson that presents from near-death experiences through the life review, where you realize so many people who describe that flat life flashing before their eyes um, talk about it as you're viewing it not from your own perspective, but the emotional perspective of those around you. So in many ways, this kind of sense of self that we have in these physical bodies dissolves when we're liberated from the, from the, from the brain and body at the time of death or in, in a near-death experience. And so that oneness is a very important concept. And the other piece of spirituality, I would say, is just the notion that it, it's going somewhere, that this is not just some vast, chaotic accident of, of you know subatomic particles kind of colliding randomly throughout the universe and giving us an apparent illusion of existence, uh, but that there's more to it. And I think uh, that is where uh, this world can wake up to a much more kind of affirming and validating reality about having a purpose here. And, and I think we have a shared purpose to understand our nature. And that's really what this kind of experience is all about. I like to go back and uh, go through the experience step by step with you. But before we do that, since it was, uh, what, 14 years ago now, and subsequently it, it took you months after you recovered to really uh, 
regain your full memory, and, and then you began the project of writing the book, which took years. Uh, and it, subsequently, I gather you've done hundreds of workshops and seminars. So you've talked about it over and over and over again. And uh, so before we go through the experience, I'm, I'm just wondering how all of the subsequent retellings of the experience may have affected your memory of it? Well, that's a very, very important point. And in fact, uh, you know, when when I first tried to tell my doctors about it in the hospital, uh, they would pat me on the back and say, well, your, your brain was covered with pus. We have no idea how you're even coming back to us. But you can forget about it because the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. So my initial instruction, and remember that this is before my semantic knowledge of neuroscience and neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, all of that came back. It, that took about two months to come back. So in this little oasis of time before all that happened, I bleed my doctors. Okay, so it was some vast hallucination. I remember my oldest son, Evan IV, who was majoring in neuroscience in college at the time, and he had been at my bedside with the rest of family members holding my hand 24-7 while I was deep in coma. Well, he had gone back to school when I started coming back to this world, and then he came home two days after I got out of the hospital. Uh, it was the day before Thanksgiving, 2008, and I remember he drove overnight to surprise me, got there about 6 a.m. I was sitting beside the fire because I couldn't sleep. That was one of the after effects of my coma. I just couldn't sleep more than an hour or two a night. Uh, but anyway, I gave him a big hug, and he, he told me later it was like there was a light shining within me that I was far more present than I'd ever been. And I remember telling him it was way too real to be real. Uh, to me, that was that meant, oh, OK, my doctors told me this could be a vast hallucination. Dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. I guess that's what it was. But I didn't yet realize just how damaged my neocortex was. That would be weeks and months later of discovery. But my son advised me. He said, write everything down before you read anybody else's near-death experience. And that was the best advice I've, I've ever received because I'd never really read any of these accounts. I knew they were out there. You encountered them in the kind of uh, general media. Uh, but I wrote 20,000 words over the next uh, five, six weeks. That was my database. That's what I had to go on. So in other words, I had a very kind of pristine recording because he knew every time you revisit a memory, you can change it. Uh, so you have to be very careful about dealing this this business of going back and harvesting memories from a certain event uh, because those memories can be altered. Uh, but that's the interesting thing to me. And I, I make this point in the book Proof of Heaven was there was this extraordinary set of circumstances that happened during the week of coma. And that spiritual experience seemed to last for months or years. It was very elaborate, very multiple passages through these different realms of, of, of the spiritual. And, uh, and the interesting thing, though, is when I then came back to this world, uh, and I was just beginning to kind of uh, get back into my prior life because when I first woke up in the ICU room, I didn't even really have language. Most of my language was not there, but I was able to muster a thank you when they pulled out the, the breathing tube and that kind of thing. Uh, but the interesting thing is for the next 36 hours after extubation, I was kind of in and out of a crazy, paranoid, uh, psychotic nightmare that seemed more real than a normal nightmare. And initially, I bundled all these experiences and said, that's all the coma experience, you know, all that deep spiritual journey and then the 36 hour kind of in and out of the ICU uh, presence, but at times really out of my mind. Um, but it turns out that the spiritual memories from the deep coma experience have been extremely resilient. And this is something Bruce Grace and other investig scientific investigators have written about. The resilience and stability of NDE memories really are right up there with traumatic lived life events, like going through a plane crash or a car crash or something like that, where those memories are just burned into you forever and do not get altered over time. And they found that NDE memories are just like that. They're very resilient. <clears throat> to me, the interesting thing is my deep coma memories, the spiritual memories, are sharp, crystal clear. They've never changed at all. This is incredible resilience. And yet, that 36-hour psychotic nightmare, and I, I wrote that down, too, of 
it faded from memory within a week or two. And in fact, I would have to go back to those notes uh, to refresh my memory about what in the world happened in that psychotic nightmare. That piece was easy to forget. But the memories of the deep, profound spiritual experience have been very uh, kind of stable and resilient over time. Now, I do recall from one of our previous conversations that currently you have a, a very serious meditation practice. Uh, I think you told me you try to meditate at least an hour every day. Well, that's absolutely true. And, you know, it's interesting in, in that year and a half or so after my coma, I read about 150 books in physics, cosmology, quantum physics, uh, neuroscience, uh, mystical experience. Uh, I was reaching everywhere I could to try to come to a deeper understanding of my own experience. But what I began to realize a year and a half, two years out was if I wanted to claim to have any kind of knowledge of consciousness, I had to explore my own and not just kind of this rudimentary armchair of, you know, examination of consensus reality of, you know, from the from the you know, comfort of my home, but to go deeply into uh, meditation. And I was exposed to, uh, or introduced, I should say, uh, to binaural beats. Uh, as a form of uh, brainwave entrainment and potential enhancement of transcendental conscious experience, uh, beginning about two years after my coma. And uh, that was fascinating to me as a neuroscientist, uh, just to uh, be very quick about it for your audience. Uh, but the reason I was fascinated is there was this notion, and this evolved from uh, the observation of a Prussian physicist back in the 1800s, Wilhelm Heinrich Dove, that if you, um, if you uh, put a single pure tone in one ear, say 100 hertz, 100 cycle per second in one ear, and a slightly different uh, signal, 104 hertz as an example, in the other ear, that the brain somehow generates the arithmetic difference between them as this wavering kind of pulsating phenomenon. So you would get a four hertz signal out of 100 and 104. Um, and so that was fascinating. It turns out in the late 20th century, investigators found that uh, such binaural beat brainwave entrainment can enhance things like out-of-body experiences, of uh, things like remote viewing, which, of course, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, is a uh, basically a scientifically validated form of information uh, acquisition uh, outside of space and time that we normally think uh, is the theater of operation of our, our mentation. But remote viewers can actually kind of blank their mind in a certain way and uh, get information about things at a distance and out of time. I mean, one of my favorite examples was when Ingo Swan, uh, back in 1973, he remote viewed the blue rings of Jupiter. Uh, and that was six years before the Voyager spacecraft went by and uh, took images of the uh, the rings of Jupiter, including the innermost blue ring, which Ingo Swan had remote viewed six years earlier. Uh, so th that's just one example. There, there are many. We talk about that a lot in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, um, about remote viewing. But anyway, this was what got my attention, was that uh, transcendental states of conscious awareness had been shown to be uh, enhanced through this process of binaural beat brainwave entrainment. And that's where I developed an interest and I soon met my partner, Karen Newell. Uh, that was in November 2011. We were both uh, uh, working in professional workshops, uh, trying to teach these kind of techniques. Um, and that's when I started really getting into this form of meditation. And for me, it's very powerful because it. I think one of the first primary goals of meditation is to get into a state of non-self. I mean, if you're if you're stuck, you know, in your with your little linguistic brain, your ego mind kind of chattering away that monkey mind in the head, uh, you're not going to get very far in meditation. And to get deeper into it, <clears throat> I found that binaural beat brainwave entrainment was very powerful. And in fact, I encouraged. Karen Newell, my partner and the co-author of Living in Mindful Universe, to get together with her bi future business partner, Kevin Cossey, who is the sound engineer for Sacred Acoustics. People can learn more at sacredacoustics.com, but I urge them to get these tones out there for the world because I had started working with them uh, as kind of their alpha tester. And uh, I was like a kid in a candy store with these uh, these uh, various uh, binaural beat brainwave entrainment 
uh, sound files that they were generating because I found them to be incredibly powerful uh, at helping me to kind of separate that linguistic brain and kind of the ego mind from a deeper sense of the the observer, of the kind of awareness of the universe. And that's where I think meditation can be incredibly powerful. I seem to recall you also suggested that these days, through your meditation, you're able to approach the states of consciousness that you experienced while you were in the coma. Yes, that's absolutely true. And in fact, I, I tell one of my favorite stories along that lines in our book, Living in Mind for Universe, where I discuss how uh, I encountered the soul of my father, my adoptive father, who... Um, you know, was was not apparent to me in my NDE, surprisingly enough. If I had scripted this, he had passed over four years before my coma. And if I had scripted it, he would have been there front and center as my spiritual guide. And yet he was not. Uh, and yet in one of these uh, uh, differential frequency brainwave enhanced meditations about two and a quarter years after my coma, I encountered my father's soul and his sense of humor came through beautifully. This incredible, you know, the way information is often transferred in, in that kind of spiritual realm is, is this incredible kind of thought ball where it all comes at once. Uh, and that's exactly what happened to me when I encountered the soul of my father. And in fact, he used the kind of double entendre, his little sense of humor, that he could not be apparent to me during my NDE. And the reasoning was, if he had been, I would have been more tempted, in spite of the fact that I had a one in 10 million diagnosis of E. coli, meningoencephalitis in an adult, and a one in a billion recovery. If it had been my father, I might have been more tempted to dismiss it as wishful thinking of, of the dying brain. Uh, and that's why it had my spiritual guide had to be someone unknown to me in a certain sense. And uh, I explain all of that in the book Proof of Heaven. Uh, but it has to do with that beautiful young woman on the butterfly wing who is my spiritual guide through most of that journey. And how I discovered her identity four months after my coma, and that uh, that she was indeed a birth sister who was related to me, uh, and yet I'd never met her in my life because I'd been adopted. Uh, and I go into all the details of that story. It, it's amazing how my adoption history uh, figures prominently in the bigger picture of the story, because so much of my life as an adoptee had been spent questioning, you know, at a deep emotional level, not some little intellectual superficial level, but the, the wrestling match in my unconscious was about my being worthy of love of this world. Could I trust in the universe uh, enough to be worthy of that kind of love? And, and that's where my NDE journey helped me to bring all that together and come into a lot of healing around that question. But it did involve revisiting my kind of adoption history. Uh, and in fact, I came to realize that my adoptive father and that beautiful birth sister who I'd never met from my birth family in many ways were in cahoots to help uh, kind of drive this uh, incredible journey of discovery uh, for me. So, uh, I mean, the all of it makes sense when I look back on it. But if you'd, you'd asked me 20 years ago if my life was headed in this direction, did I think that made any sense? I would have said, of course not, not one bit. And yet looking back on it, it makes beautiful sense. And the meditation has been very important. Uh, now, I think the important one thing I'd like to stress, though, is it's not as if I can just encounter my father's soul or Betsy's soul, you know, that beautiful birth sister on command. Uh, they it, it depends on them and, and on their kind of will when they show up. And I can go in inviting them and I, I get the feeling that often they're right there ready to communicate. But there are many times in meditation where I try and set that stage for their appearance and they don't come through. So <clears throat> uh, I think it's important for people to understand that uh, the reality is there of our connection with loved ones through meditation, through dreams. Uh, through spontaneous epiphanies, what have you. They're all different forms of after-death uh, communications. Uh, but to be open to the reality of it. And the more we do that, the more I think uh, uh, they will start to give us evidence that they're actually there in real time to help us with the issues of our lives uh, even today. Going through the illness itself, I presume that 
you didn't just suddenly fall into a coma. That it, it probably happened gradually. At least it must have taken a matter of minutes or hours, uh, and, and you began entering into a, a different state other than your normal state of consciousness. What was that like? Well, that was uh, that was really extraordinary because what. What happened was uh, really the night before I was not feeling any kind of illness other than some slight sniffles. We, you know, the family had been trading a virus back and forth through the week and I was hoping I would avoid it. Uh, so not really much in the way of symptoms, but at 430 in the morning, November 10th, I woke up with horrific back pain. Uh, and I explain in proof of heaven uh, the mathematics of this, how rapidly E. coli can uh, reproduce and go from, you know, one or two bacteria to trillions of bacteria, literally over uh, 12 hours or so. And so, uh, you know, it was soon after that uh, I, I was able to make my way down the hallway in baby steps, get into a bathtub and put in hot water, trying to relieve the muscle spasm in my back. I almost couldn't even get up out of that tub. I mean, I was in horrific pain and it just got worse and worse uh, every minute. I was able to pull myself up uh, by a towel over the towel rack back to the bed where I collapsed in a cold sweat, just uh, in agony. And it was soon thereafter that my youngest son, Bond, came in the room and saw, oh my gosh, dad is in horrible shape. And he went up and he started rubbing my temples. And as soon as he did that, it felt like he'd driven a white hot uh, spike through my head. It was just horrific pain. And of course, anybody out there in medicine who hears of sudden onset of back pain and severe headache would think of meningitis. First thing that comes to your mind, and yet the doctor was already out. My brain was being overrun by an extremely aggressive, primitive, and should have killed me bacterial meningoencephalitis that was, uh, you know, in a very hell-bent way uh, trying to uh, kill me in that moment. And so about the last thing I remember uh, is uh, uh, that Bond was getting ready for school, and I thought, my gosh, if this really gets much worse— I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And then I had these visions of uh, typical of a doctor in the emergency room where you're just embarrassed to even be there. Sooner or later, the symptoms would resolve and you'd kind of walk out of the ER sheepishly. Sorry, guys, didn't mean to bother you. <clears throat> and that's what I envisioned. And I remember kind of crying out to him, have a good day at school, Bond. <clears throat> and those were the last words I said, uh, at least for a few hours. Uh, and then I just lapsed into coma and I really don't remember much about it. I remember just horrific pain and discomfort and, uh, and, and kind of a feeling of what in the world is going on. But I was so far gone by then I couldn't even attach that sense of wonder to any kind of meaningful memory of anything. And then I really was just gone from this world. Uh, and it was soon thereafter that my former spouse, Holly, looked in the room, saw I was having grand mal seizures, and that's when she called 911. And, uh, uh, you know, the important thing to get is I was already deep in coma when they hauled me seizing into the emergency room. And that's when uh, Dr. Laura Potter, who was the ER physician who uh, took care of me, I'd also worked with her side by side in that same ER for more than two years uh, in the past. So she knew me well, but she didn't recognize me because she was just told by the nurses, you know, 54 year old white male in extremis in, in major uh, major bay one. And so she went in there and she started working on me and then recognized, oh, my God, this is one of my colleagues. And it just shocked her no end. And she knew at that time, and then when she got the report back from microbiology from the spinal tap that it was uh, gram-negative bacteria, uh, she knew I was in trouble because anyone with gram-negative uh, meningitis who goes into coma over you know three hours, is, which is my history, uh, is in deep trouble. And that's where she estimated I had a 10% chance of survival, uh, or my doctors did. I don't know if that was her estimate. Um, but the other doctors taking care of me, the ICU estimated 10% chance of survival. And of course it just went downhill from there. Uh, as I explain in, in the book, proof of heaven, uh, things just got worse day after day. And finally by day seven of coma, that was a Sunday morning, the 16th of November. That's when the doctors were recommending stopping the antibiotics and letting nature take its course.
during that week while you were in in coma and also experiencing what what we're calling a near death experience uh, were you also at, uh, from time to time communicating in any way well, the, the only communication, and th this is leads to a, a little bit of kind of, I'd say, a misunderstanding in the case report, is that uh, after I'd been in the ER for about two hours or so, uh, and of course, I don't remember any of this. I had to get every bit of it from other people. Uh, but after about two hours of just kind of uh, grunts and groans and seizing and absolutely nothing showing any sign of being human, um, I cried out, God help me. And I kind of screamed it. And um, my former spouse, my Episcopal rector, who was out with her in the waiting area, they heard it. A lot of the nurses and doctors heard it. Uh, they heard me scream that out. And that momentarily gave me a Glasgow Coma Scale score of 11, <laughs> you know, where I, you or I would score a 15, a corpse would score a three. Anything below nine is deep coma. But the very fact that I could cry out, God help me, which I do not remember at all. None of that's in my personal re memory. Um, that gave me that 11. But most of my all the rest of my neurologic exam, both in the ER and that week, gave me about a six or seven. And at times from the nursing notes, it's clear that I was probably down to a five. Uh, and in addition to that, for anyone who pays attention to the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, my oculocardiac reflex vanished. And that's a very deep uh, brainstem reflex that usually only goes when you're in deep trouble and, and really about to die. Uh, and that combined with uh, Glasgow Coma Scales of six to seven or even as low as five, I mean, should tell anybody and everybody this was an extremely deadly coma and especially with the uh, CT and MRI data that revealed that no no lobe of my brain was spared the impact of this meningoencephalitis. It really was uh, t attacking both uh, hemispheres very completely uh, to the point where the scan showed uh, edema and swelling way down at the deep end of the of the neocortex, which means if you've got meningitis causing it, that that inflammatory uh, toxic uh, stimulus is going through the entire neocortex. And I explain in the appendices to proof of heaven why that's so important, because it really kind of takes away any of the last arguments from a materialist neuroscientist that some little piece of my brain could still participate in providing some kind of reality. Now, of course, to me, <laughs> the giant mystery is that reality was so much more complex, detailed, memorable, meaningful, and powerful than any reality I'd ever been through before. How in the world do you postulate that happens when your brain is so effectively dismantled? And again, that's why I think the scientific community takes my case so seriously. There's a Brazilian spiritualist film, maybe you've seen it, called No Solar, which translates in, into our city. It's based on a, a book, you could call it a novel, I suppose. It was channeled through the famous Brazilian medium, Chico Xavier, and uh, supposedly an account of the afterlife from a medical doctor who, who in the book is named Andre Luis, who dies. He finds himself in a in a purgatory region, a dark region full of unpleasant characters until he calls out for help from God, as, as you apparently did. And, and it's at that point that his experience in, in the afterlife changes. So I imagine that possibly that moment that others observed that you don't even remember might have been very important in the subsequent experiences you had. Well, I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head, and that has been my thought going a long way back. Uh, in fact, one of the earliest lessons I gleaned from all this to sh try and share with others in our meditation workshops and in my presentations and talks was that the beliefs that we are taught by our society will dominate kind of our emergent reality. So be careful what you believe in, uh, because beliefs can be incredibly power, both powerful, both in a positive and a negative sense, and in leading us towards truth or away from it. Um, and, but, but what I often say in the same kind of context of this particular framing of my situation uh, is absolutely believe in the reality of asking for that help. 
uh, just try it out. See where it takes you, because it's amazing how powerful that kind of request can be. It kind of reminds me of, of uh, Larry Dossie's book, uh, uh, Be Careful What You Pray For, uh, where he makes it very clear that, the, that our beliefs can be, uh, uh, have much more power than we generally think. Uh, and why not let them work in our favor uh, and believe in the positive things that can bring benefits to our lives? But I think you've hit the nail on the head. I do believe my utterance of those words, God help me, even though I have no personal memory of it, but I also have no doubt that those words happened. And they also, interestingly enough, though, had to happen at a time when my brain was horribly attacked. You know, so the fact that it had just been guttural moans and groans for hours how in the world did I muster that God help me uh, to come up in that moment and then just dive right back deep into coma? I don't know. But to me, it's an important part of the story for exactly the kind of reasons that you're you're indicating that it's about belief and about asking for help. Uh, and that, and I found in meditation that that works tremendously when I go in asking for help, asking for assistance, asking for guidance, uh, that often in meditation, that's what I get. But of course I have to be, uh, quite removed from the ego and the ego mind and my linguistic brain can state or request, a, uh, an intention going into meditation. But the thing I've learned about meditation that I think has helped me so much is to then be able to put that little ego mind into time out. So it's not pestering me, you know, as I'm trying to dive deep into this relationship through the veil with the primordial mind and uh, this kind of deep understanding of, of consciousness uh, at a unified level. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's fascinating how the meditation has helped me to come to a much richer understanding and cultivation of that kind of uh, relationship. Well, going into the actual experience, my recollection is from your book that your first awareness was just being a, a speck of consciousness without any memory whatsoever. There you are, just pure awareness. That was it. And, you know, important to point out at that point, that realization there were no words, no language. I had no memories of Earth, of humanity, of this universe. It really was an empty slate, uh, a tabula rasa, which I think uh, was crucial for my particular journey. I mean, one thing I've come to realize, having talked with thousands of people who have had these experiences and read uh, you know, hundreds of additional accounts in books and in the scientific literature, uh, is that the, the uh, situation, the experience is always tailored for the individual soul. First and foremost, that's what matters, is that it, it match where that soul is and their understanding and helps to catalyze transformation to an, a next level. Uh, and so for me, that it made perfect sense that this complete deletion of memory would be so important. And, and I think that that realization comes through, especially in our third book, in Living in a Mindful Universe, where I go into great detail about memory and how it doesn't even seem to be stored in the brain. Uh, so, so that, uh, uh, for me, you know, what I ended up getting out of this NDE in terms of an understanding of brain, mind, consciousness, you know, some lifelong passions of mine to understand, uh, it, it just uh, is extraordinary how much uh, I glean from it all. And if I tried to kind of set the stage myself, I never could have set it up uh, in such a powerful way. But that's why it also had to, I guess, violate some of the accepted rules that people apply to NDEs. Although in reality, uh, for example, if you use Bruce Grayson's uh, NDE scale, uh, which is a maximum 32 point scale to assess 16 different features of a near death experience that are spread across four uh, broad categories, you know, the uh, categories of the paranormal, of the uh, uh, transcendental, uh, these, these kind of different categories for these 16 items. And mine scored a 28 or 29, depending on exactly how you do the scoring. Uh, but it's way up there in terms of an NDE, even though this amnesia was a very atypical feature, that I had none of the memories of Evan Alexander's uh, life, religious uh, beliefs, or scientific knowledge. None of that came with me. Uh, and it was only applied kind of after the fact, after I came back from the coma, when I started recovering those memories of my life, that they actually started to interact 
with a spiritual journey. And then it was this, uh, you know, elaborate 14 year odyssey of trying to make sense of it all in a way that that comes together and makes sense. And to me, uh, one of the most beautiful gifts was coming to realize uh, within two years of my coma, uh, when I went up to UVA and gave a talk for the Division of Perceptual Studies on my experience, and these scientists who had studied consciousness for decades were all kind of nodding their heads as if they were perfectly on board with me in terms of what I was describing which is not what I expected. I, I expected that there would be some pushback and this, that, but it was, uh, it was like, they were like, of course, this, we, we hear this story all the time. And to me, it was such an unusual story, but I've come to realize how it fits so well with NDEs at large. And that's when you study them, uh, you know, in large numbers as you, especially having your uh, half half century experience in parapsychology, you realize you, that things start to uh, kind of coalesce and line up, and there are regularities and commonalities in these stories that are pretty much predictable uh, that show us that this is a real realm. Uh, it's not just you know hallucination, imagination, some kind of woo-woo nonsense, but that this is something that humans uh, should pay attention to because it has a lot to do with our broader experience as sentient beings. So I presume as a pure speck of awareness, uh, that implies no awareness of any kind of a body uh, and no awareness of uh, your environment either at that point. Well, what it what it meant, and it all started in a realm that I call the earthworm's eye view. Uh, but the speck of awareness uh, is that I was aware. I had a memory of events around me. So the environment was something that I absolutely was interacting with. Now, I had at no point during the entire week experience did I have any sense of body. There was never a looking at my hands or a sense that I was hearing with ears or looking with eyes. It's one of the reasons uh, I often explain, you know, that these experiences are so ineffable, so indescribable, that our language is so poor at trying to describe them is because our modes of knowing in that realm are far grander than our modes of knowing here. And our modes of knowing here, for example, what we see with the eyes, hear with the ears, we can touch, taste, smell, all of our sensory modalities, body position, et cetera. Um, but those are all heavily filtered uh, by, by the brain and by our nervous system uh, to where there are very limited trickle that I think is, is the information that's there for us to survive, you know, as a bodily being. And the, the, uh, the mistake is to assume that our conscious awareness is ours alone and is generated between our ears by the three and a half pound gelatinous mass sitting in a warm, dark bath inside of our skulls. That is the mistake. That brain is serving as a filter, a reducing valve, as uh, William James and uh, others have put it. Um, and that is where uh, my speck of awareness was uh, really kind of taking note of all these things. And I was not feeling any sense of real will that I was able to drive my, my presence. But the thing that I often point out to people in our meditation workshops is music, sound, vibration, what we remember as music, uh, can be used as an engine to traverse those spiritual realms. And that's why to me it's fascinating that today uh, I acknowledge how music was what came with those uh, light portals that basically ushered me up. It all began in what I call that earth where my view, a very primitive, coarse, and unresponsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. Uh, and of course, people who heard my talks early on would say, well, was that hell or purgatory? Well, I think hell or purgatory would be at least a little bit interactive. And in this realm, even though I had no language, I could still kind of wonder who, what, where, you know, the questions of, 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 of details about this experience could emerge, you know, what's going on. Uh, but there was never a flicker of response from that realm. And that's why it was so interesting how I seemed to sense a, a kind of connection of will when that slowly spinning white light came towards me. And it, it, I remember it had appearance like kind of ground glass and these fine, uh, silvery and golden tendrils off of it. And as it came towards me, it also came packaged with a perfect musical uh, kind of melody. 
Uh, and that was the surprising thing. And that melody came in very handy because much later in the experience, as I would ascend through different levels and then find myself back in the earthworm's eye view, by remembering the musical notes of the melody, I could conjure up that spinning portal of light. And it would come towards me again, and it opened up like a wormhole. It was like a portal leading from this kind of murky realm of the gateway of the uh, earthworm eye view up into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley uh, that was filled with many earth-like features. For example, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. There were millions of other butterflies, colors beyond the rainbow, all looping and spiraling in these vast formations. Down below us was this meadow. It was a perfectly rich, verdant, fertile mellow, a meadow that was lush with life, uh, blossoms, uh, flowers, buds on trees, everything opening in this rich, dynamic fashion. Uh, I often describe it as kind of like Plato's world of ideals. It was kind of like a personal world of ideals that we would go to, and this would be where we reunite with our higher soul, with souls of departed loved ones, go through life reviews, plan next incarnations. All these kinds of things would occur in this, this kind of coalescence point of this uh, gateway valley. There was a connection between spiritual realms and with the lowest of material realms and with sentient beings and with consciousness and soul lines, all that kind of thing. And that uh, that experience, though, was so uh, kind of shocking and extraordinary because of its ultra reality. And that is because of what I call knowledge through identification, where we become others in that scene. We become entire groups. Uh, and in fact, as this process continued, uh, I, I, my awareness became one with the awareness of the entire universe going up into the core realm and that kind of thing. Getting a little ahead of myself because this gateway valley uh, was really extraordinary. And in the meadow below us were thousands of beings dancing, lots of joy and merriment. And I have very... Uh, uh, powerful memories of children playing and dogs jumping, and uh, they were wearing simple but very colorful garb. And all of these festivities were being fueled because up above in this blue-black velvety sky that was filled with billowing clouds of pure color, there were these swooping orbs, these uh, kind of ovoid uh, golden uh, spiritual beings that I later called angelic choirs as I wrote all this up weeks later. Uh, and these choirs were emanating these chants and anthems, hymns that would thunder through my awareness. And I, I know that it was around that point of my awareness of this in, incredible scale of these kind of spiritual events uh, that I, I had the sensation of this soft summer breeze blowing through. Uh, and even though my, my verbal description of what was going on did not change with that breeze, my emotional truth changed dramatically because that breeze, as I called it in my writings weeks later, the divine wind, the breath of God, this was this incredible sense of this unification of this infinitely loving being that was the generator of all of this, but it, but kind of a co-creator. That was the important thing, was this, this uh, divine being of pure wholeness and healing loved us so much as to allow us to express our free will. And that's where, uh, you know, to me, that whole notion within materialist neuroscience that consciousness is an illusion, it's chemical reactions, electron fluxes in the brain all following natural laws, there's no free will. That's where it absolutely hit the road that it was a 180 degree flip that this is all about soul lines, about purpose in life, about true free will dictating our emerging reality. Uh, and I saw, started having these incredible visions, especially on entering the core realm, about how all that was controlled. But the, the main thing to point out here is that in this gateway valley, uh, I was not alone. There was this beautiful young woman uh, beside me on the butterfly wing. And of course, those who read Proof of Heaven will realize her identity was absolutely crucial to my understanding the reality of this journey. It was an identity I didn't discover until, until more than four months after my coma. Uh, but uh, her message to me, I think, was the central message I was to bring back to this world. Uh, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. Uh, you are deeply uh, cared for. Uh, and the other uh, piece of that message, I wish I clarified this in Proof of Heaven, was you can do no wrong. 
Uh, and people take that, uh, the way I put it there, I thought I explained myself better, but I didn't. Uh, and that is by this point, the journey with this beautiful guardian angel, with this recognition of the ambience of love and the importance of love, kindness, and compassion, uh, that, you know, most near death experiencers, that's what gives them, uh, their liberation from the fear of death is realizing that when we die, we actually expand our conscious awareness and it comes into this much more loving, um, and uh, kind of a spiritual home uh, that's very accepting and nurturing to us. Uh, and that was an extraordinary uh, gift, was that very feeling and bathing in that ocean of love. And that was what that divine uh, breath was all about, that uh, breath of God, uh, was this recognition that, that that God force of pure healing and wholeness was all throughout every bit of this. And it was at that time that I, I remember seeing all of uh, kind of the lowest dimensions, four dimensional space time collapsing down. And then all of the spiritual realm of, of the uh, Gateway Valley with all of its beautiful and brilliant spiritual features and a very different ordering of causality, what I call deep time. Important to stress that earth time is part of the part of the drama that allows this, this kind of drama to unfold in our material lives. But in a life review, you realize that the universe has the ability to not just give us a memory of that as a life review, but for us to relive it. When you talk to uh, so many people who have been through these experiences, you find out how detailed they are and how we re-engage. And we do so in such a fashion that, in fact, the truth is revealed to us, not only from our own perspective, but the emotional perspective of those around us. So to have that kind of a stage setting where you can relive those uh, life events in real form uh, shows you kind of the power of the universe to um, – arrange for all of this. And that's what allows for our soul journeys in this much grander sense. Now, it turns out, uh, as you might surmise, that the Gateway Valley was not a stopping point. And that's when I realized that those angelic choirs were providing yet another musical portal to higher and higher levels. And so I saw all of that collapsing down, including uh, deep time in that spiritual realm, as I ascended through another light portal that had been provided by those angelic choirs and their music up into the core. And the core was an infinite inky blackness. It was filled to overflowing with the divine healing whole love of that God force. And in the core, I was told, not in words, but conceptual flow, and the words I wrote weeks later to explain it all, you're not here to stay. We'll teach you many things, but you'll be going back. And uh, that to me was... Uh, uh, just the beginning of everything that kind of unfolded there, too, because in the core realm, many lessons, visions uh, about reincarnation, about life reviews, about soul lines and journeys, about uh, evolution of all consciousness. I mean, this incredible set of visions of civilizations advanced far beyond ours that are involved in the same process of sentient beings contributing to the kind of self-knowledge, self-awareness of the universe. Uh, and then, as I've described in Proof of Heaven and in many presentations, I would spontaneously tumble back down from that core level, that sanctum sanctorum of the divine, where, in fact, the entire higher dimensional multiverse had been presented to me as this complex oversphere to serve as a mode of teaching lessons, well, then I'd tumble back down into the earthworm's eye view. And that was a giant mystery to me when it first happened. Uh, but then uh, I, I pretty rapidly realized by remembering the musical notes of that melody, I could conjure up the light portal that would then take me back up into that gateway valley, always reassured by that beautiful uh, woman with the sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, broad smile, who never said a word. But her message came to me telepathically and with pure emotional truth of her reality uh, that I was deeply loved and cherished and had nothing to fear. And of course, all of that coalesced four months after my coma when I ca finally came to realize the identity of that uh, sister being my, uh, being my birth sister who I'd never known uh, but only learned about uh, in the year 2000, uh, you know, which is two years after she had passed from the physical plane. So, and uh, that's kind of the journey uh, in a nutshell until, until the point where I started to emerge from it all. 
As I listen to you, what I'm hearing are three distinct realms. The earthworm's eye view, uh, which is like dirty jello, the gateway valley, and the core realm. Exactly. Yes, I would say those three realms were there. There did seem to be other kind of intervening elements that were part of the translation between realms. But by and large, the, the entire journey uh, was mainly focused within those three realms. You're right. And you were able to travel between those realms through uh, by remembering. I think it was the phrase you use, remembering the music. Right. The musical notes and they, you know, that kind of thing in that realm was very memorable. Uh, and I also had memory uh, of events sequentially as, as, as traversing these realms. So that, for example, uh, in an early passage through the core, I had uh, my initial vision uh, that I've, I've come to interpret as kind of a vision of, of uh, life review and reincarnation. And it's what I call the flying fish vision. Uh, and, and it's exactly what it sounds like. I, I had this very strong sense that uh, we were flying fish and down in the material realm, we were temporarily dumbed down. We didn't have the knowledge of higher soul. We were living this life with skin in the game, believing it was our only incarnation. And that's what kind of flavored and colored all of our interactions with our fellow fish. But then when we died, we'd be up out of the water, back up in the air, coasting along with our fellow fish who had already left the physical plane, going through life reviews, uh, planning next incarnations, then diving back in. So that was an early version. And to me, uh, I remember that later because in a later passage through the core, uh, there was a much richer and more profound version uh, that took me even longer to figure out. It's what I call the Indra's net version. Uh, and this, this was a vision of a higher dimensional uh, kind of network of interwoven silvery and golden tendrils that were all interwoven in this beautiful fabric. And the fabric was really the fabric of our very existence. And it showed free will. It showed the evolution of all consciousness. In many ways, it reflected what I came to see as the whole purpose for this existence. Uh, in uh, months later, when I was reading Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's The Phenomenon of Man, written in the mid 20th century. And of course, he as a paleontologist, he was a scientist with a view to long time scales, billions of years. But he was also very spiritual as a French Jesuit priest. And his book uh, was written at a time when there was a lot of discussion going on around Darwinian evolution in biological systems. Uh, and what he realized is, yes, evolution is happening, but it's much, much bigger than this, this puny little evolution of biological systems on Earth. And he saw all of sentience throughout the universe, all of consciousness as evolving. And in many ways, that's how I came uh, to see this whole process, especially based on my Indra's net uh, vision, where this, this uh, the life reviews, the re uh, reuniting with souls of departed loved ones, and this thread work, this beautiful interweaving. It's almost like uh, incarnation and then uh, between lives and then reincarnation between lives. is like breathing in and out in this process of transformation. It's almost like the living process of consciousness through these breaths of incarnation and then uh, intermission periods, incarnation, intermission period, uh, is working towards that golden center that I saw in that network of the Indra's net vision, which uh, basically is beyond the horizon of human ability to even understand or envision at this point in time. And that's because our human minds can only go so far. Even unfettered uh, in the realm of primordial mind, it's very difficult to bring back concepts that are much advanced beyond humanity at the, of the current era. Uh, I witnessed uh, civilizations that are far more advanced than that, and I mentioned those briefly uh, in Proof of Heaven, but I do not believe that uh, we can really uh, envision the long distance goal of all this. But I think the short distance goal and the short distance is within five to 10,000 years of human history and destiny in that short time scale, I think we can envision that the lessons that we are to learn uh, are really about oneness and about kindness and compassion and forgiveness and living together. And, you know, people often ask, well, what are the deep lessons of an NDE? Those are the deep lessons. 
And uh, you might think, well, wait, that's too simple. Well, no, it's not. Uh, it's what I believe the world is challenged with now. It's the reason I believe we're awakening to a truth that goes far beyond the bleak and paltry fiction of materialist neuroscience that tries to pretend that your brain creates consciousness, your existence is birth to death and nothing more. But in fact, we have great responsibility for our choices and consciousness is evolving in a gigantic way. And the status quo that's been dictated by and large from the materialist paradigm with a false sense of separation leads us, you know, into this uh, thinking that we're separate beings. And this new quantum informed vision of consciousness, which I think the world is awakening to, I, certainly the scientific community is awakening to, uh, is really a way of rescuing us from the madness of our materialist focus on a false sense of separation and a really destructive and toxic relationship between those parts. I'm sensing in your description, Evan, uh, uh, what I would call a fractal pattern here. Uh, you're describing the cycle of birth and death and, and rebirth and the intermission period. Uh, but you also describe a cycle where you seem to be cycling back and forth between the earthworm's view, the uh, gateway valley, and the, the core realm back down again, where first you have the flying fish vision, and then it becomes more elaborate as the Indra's net vision. It's sort of a, a miniature uh, pattern of death and rebirth, even while you're in that state. Well, I think, I think that's a very good observation. And uh, I love your uh, use of the word fractal, because in so many ways, that's exactly what this is. You know, as above, so below, as within, so without. Uh, once we start to realize, and Karen and I discuss this in our book, in Living in a Mindful Universe, uh, this whole idea of subjective versus objective knowledge, and we really argue that um, we might have a consensus reality where our language tends to uh, uh, show an alignment and a kind of a consensus uh, version of, of truth and what's going on, uh, but in many ways, uh, you know, it, it goes uh, far, far deeper than that. And um, and yet it's reflected uh, at the many different layers and levels of, of what humans do and how sentient beings interact with uh, the world at large and with themselves. And in this uh, discussion, though, we talk about what's called the supreme illusion. And the supreme illusion is an observation that, um, you know, I sit here and I witness all this around me, all this out there, but never, ever forget that what you're witnessing is a very good model within mind that we presume reflects uh, a reality about what is out there. Uh, and yet, um, in, in, in so many ways, it's it, crucial to remember, it's always uh, and, and never been anything more than that internal model of mind uh, representing a world out there. And what we know, especially through the modern world of psychology and of quantum physics, I would say is another beautiful field that reveals this to us. But our knowledge of reality is very much kind of tainted by our nervous systems. And uh, really, we cannot even assume that uh, kind of cause and effect within a materialist sense is really applicable, especially when you get to some of the deeper features uh, of these kind of journeys and, and expansions of our, our awareness. Back to the three realms that we've talked about, uh, how many times would you say you cycled back and forth um, between these three realms? Well, that is, you know, I've, I've meditated over that and tried to come up with some uh, reasonable answer. Uh, but there's not an exact count. I would say it was three to five times, something like that. It wasn't like 20, uh, and it was more than two, but uh, it was enough so that I realized that I actually had uh, a form of will to enable me to traverse, uh, you know, from one level to the next. And uh, I think that's especially important when you look back on the whole experience, because my general feeling was I was being shown things um, and demonstrated for my benefit, and yet I my my engagement through the process 
was uh, given that I had no memory of any attachment to um, the material realm, uh, even though I didn't really have a concept of the material realm beyond what had been shown to me as I traversed these levels and saw especially the collapse of the material realm. Um, and it was uh, uh, really, but the interesting thing is I, I, I felt like it could all continue or it could cease. It did not matter. Uh, and that gave me some real ability to flow with this because I had no fears, no anxieties, no concerns. Uh, and that is until the very end. And, uh, you know, because as I've told at the, as the end of this process, I was told in the core, you're not here to stay. And there did come a time towards the end of the journey when I tried to conjure up uh, the musical notes that would that would bring me that portal that led from the earthworm's eye view up into the Gateway Valley. And it didn't work. And I realize now, you know, this is what they were telling me. I'm not here to stay. I'll be going, quote, back. Didn't know what that meant yet. Um, and that's when I saw uh, I had this vision of thousands of beings around me going off into the distance and many with. Uh, heads down, uh, some with arms up like this, some holding candles, some with hoods. But there was this murmuring energy coming from them. And that murmuring energy to me was very surprising because what it brought with it was the same sense of comfort, being in a spiritual home, being taken care of that I'd already felt through the through the uh, Gateway Valley and through the core realm. But now I was feeling it down in this murky kind of primordial muck uh, of the earthworm's eye view that uh, that kind of realm, this uh, beautiful sense. Uh, and what I called it all when I wrote it up weeks later, I said that was a power of prayer, that I had a sense of all these beings, uh, that there was this prayer coming from them to help usher me and kind of guide me in return. Um and it was after that that I saw six faces that would kind of bubble up out of the buck. And those six faces were very important, as I explained in the, in the book, Proof of Heaven. They provided what are called veridical time anchors, uh, because five of those faces were of people who were physically present in the ICU room uh, the last 24 hours I was in coma. And notably, there were numerous family and friends who had been there earlier in the week who I had no memory of whatsoever. Uh, so those five faces of people physically present at the very end of the coma helped me to realize that the vast majority of the coma had to happen between days one in four or one in five. And I explain all that in the book, uh, that one in four, or one in five has to do with the fact that one of the faces I saw was of someone who was not physically present at all. And that was Susan Rinches. Susan Rinches, it turns out I had first met uh, in our freshman English class in 1972 at UNC Chapel Hill, where she was in my class and we became friends. Uh, we then lost track of each other, but we reunited years later because she was teaching with my former spouse, Holly, uh, at a high school in Raleigh, and they became very good friends. And that's when Holly was aware that Susan, in addition uh, to her work, I think as a French teacher, um, was also busy channeling, that she would help people, like people in coma, things like that. She wrote a book called Third Eye Open and uh, talked about how she would help people. And so my family remembered that when I was in coma. So they had reached out to Susan during my coma week and asked her to intervene. And so it, deep in my coma, Susan's right there front and center with these other uh, five faces. And uh, so when I was first waking up, you know, when I saw the faces in that moment towards the end of coma, I had no idea who they were. I remember them today visually as if it had just happened this morning. I mean, sharp, crystal clear visual memory of their face. It would say these words and then disappear. Um, but, uh, you know, at the time I didn't know who they were. And uh, so when I in the first hours after waking up as my language is coming back to me, I'm trying to explain these things. And I explained those faces. And I said, and Susan Wrenches was here. And they said, well, she wasn't physically here, but she was 120 miles away channeling to you uh, from her home in Chapel Hill. And when I was told that, I went, of course. I knew where I'd been. Of course, you don't get there locally. <laughs> you know, that's all totally non-local. So it made perfect sense that Susan was there, too. But it was really that sixth face that brought sheer terror to me. It was the face of a 10-year-old boy, my son Bond. And I didn't recognize him at the time. And that was that Sunday morning. 
And he had overheard the, the doctors and their conference where they said, well, he's gone from 10% chance of survival to 2%, but there's no chance he's going to recover. We don't know of any cases in the literature of gram-negative bacterial uh, meningoencephalitis this sick for this long who then end up with a full recovery. And that's why they were rec recommending termination of care. And Bond heard those words and he knew it was bad. So he came running down the hallway and there I was uh, lying on my ICU bed on my ventilator as I had been for seven days, eyes taped shut. He pulls open my eyelids, one eye looking over here, one eye over there, neither pupil responding. Those of you in medicine know that's a horrible picture. And I promise you, I did not hear him with my ears. I didn't see him with my eyes, but he was pleading with me, daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. I didn't understand the words, but throughout this entire journey of thinking I was being shown things, having a, a bit of a sense of will uh, being manifested through these portals that could come up through memory of musical notes and through the angelic choirs and things like that, um, and then, but seeing Bond's face all of a sudden and sensing the connection, that was the thing. I had no idea who he was. I didn't really know, you know, that this being that I was could have a, quote, son. But wow, did that get my attention? And now I was terrified because I knew I had to come back for him no matter what, that, uh, that appeal to me across uh, all of those dimensions of the spiritual realm. I had to come back. It's the hardest thing I ever have done in my life. I often likened it to crawling out of a hole in a gravel pit where every time you reach up, the gravel just falls and buries you even deeper. It seemed impossible at the time. And yet it was impossible not to come back. I had to come back. I knew that much from that encounter. And really, I think that kind of echoes what uh, many other near-death experiencers have said. They they talk about how beautiful those realms are, but how ultimately they made a free will choice to come back to this world out of a sense of responsibility uh, to a fellow being, to another soul, what have you. And that's really what I came to realize in this journey was I had to come back. And it was very challenging because I had no idea how to do all that. Uh, but in fact, it ended up, my will ended up uh, kind of forcing the issue and I came back to my body. When I did, important to point out, I did not even recognize my mother, my sons, my sisters standing at the bedside. I had no idea who these beings were. My language was just beginning to come back to me uh, after, you know, I was fighting the endotracheal tube and then phew, finally they pulled that out. I went, Thank you. Uh, you know, I don't even remember that, but those words have been reported back to me. So it was coming back uh, that, that uh, you know, I was coming back to this world. Um, and, and my sisters of uh, Phyllis and Betsy, two of my three sisters, uh, were still around and were, uh, you know, they got permission from the nurses to stay at my bedside in the neuro step down unit. And they were very frustrated because I never slept. I mean, I was so kind of agitated by this whole experience. As I said, I had that 36 hour paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare, ICU psychosis. I know what that looks like. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the rich, ultra real spiritual visions of my NDE experience. Uh, but that coming back process was was wild. And I remember, uh, you know, it, it, at one point when I was maybe five or six days back from coma, uh, my sister brought me a, a Skype call on a computer from my son, Evan, who was working on a school project. And he asked for my help. Uh, and, and he mistakenly, Phyllis said, yeah, your dad's waking up here. And I was a wreck. I was still kind of a mess. And Evan said it was one of the most frightening things he's ever seen because he'd heard that I was recovering and coming back to this world. But when he tried to talk to me, it was obvious my brain was still really badly, uh, kind of impacted by this uh, experience. Although my memories were coming back. I was beginning to integrate it all, but it was a wild process. Uh, and it took the better part of two months uh, really for uh, my knowledge to come back. And the interesting thing to me, uh, as, I, as we point out in Living in a Mindful Universe, is that in many ways I came to realize from some of the deep conversations with close family and friends, both long before coma and then after coma about similar topics, that my memories around many events were more complete after that two month point post coma than they had been before the coma. And it, it really brings to discussion a lot of the 
kind of a fantastic nature of memory itself and, and consciousness. But what I've come to realize is the brain does serve as a filter that can access these things, but don't be looking for a long-term permanent memory storage within the brain itself. I mean, that's something that neurosurgeons have suspected for a long time. You know, in spite of more than a century of craniotomies and removing brain tissue, there's never been a reported case of a long-term swathe of, of, of long-term memories disappearing with the resection of any part of brain. It just doesn't happen. Neurosurgeons figured out in the early 1950s that if you damage the medial temporal lobes, uh, the uh, amygdala, uh, hippocampus, things like that, you can interfere with, uh, bilateral damage can interfere with conversion of short-term to long-term memories. But in terms of postulating a site in the brain where long-term memories are stored, we, there doesn't seem to be one. Uh, and this matches the neurosurgical kind of case data over a century. Uh, and it's something we talk about in detail in the book, especially in an appendix on memory itself, uh, because especially when you get into that huge literature about consciousness concerning past life memories in children, suggestive of reincarnation, you realize, of course, there's no material structure that enables conveyance of those memories from one lifetime to the next, especially when you realize that only one fifth of those reincarnation cases are related and have a hereditary kind of connection. The other 80% of them are not related at all, uh, other than just being of the same species. So, uh, you know, it's fascinating, but memory does not seem to be stored in the brain whatsoever. Well, we should do a future conversation just focusing on memory. I, I would love to. But what I'd like to do is go back to the earthworm's eye view. The, you described it as dirty jello. Uh, the, the idea of earthworm suggests that it's muck or, or mud. It actually reminds me of, I used to go up to Calistoga, California, where they have hot springs, and Dr. Wilkerson's, where they have mud baths, and you would take a bath inside the hot mud. It was very healing, and I suspect that this this earthworm's eye view that you kept returning to had uh, some healing properties. Now, originally, you describe it as not being at all interactive, but later on, as these images appear and faces appear, it does seem to become interactive. Well, it, it does. And the fact that it was this uh, kind of a continuing base of operations that I would return to and then kind of emerge from uh, suggested some real importance to me. Now, initially, I would say in the months after my coma, I tended to default to an idea that that earth from my view was the best consciousness that my physical brain could muster while it was soaking in pus. And therefore, I had that in, in uh, uh, comparison. I had these beautiful ultra real you know, the gateway valley and the core realm that were so rich and intricate and filled with d detail, uh, very, very different from the earthworm's eye view. And I know in many of the early talks I gave, I started giving talks about my experience to the public in April of 2010. So that was uh, two and a half years before Proof of Heaven came out. And often in those talks, people would question me, was, was this earthworm eye view hell or purgatory? Uh, and as I've said, I would think that would be at least a little bit uh, responsive. And that earthworm eye view, by and large, was unresponsive. Although, as you point out, with further uh, kind of passages, it became much more something I was used to and actually even comfortable in, especially with that beautiful healing energy from the prayer that I that I described a little while ago about the thousands of beings around me. Um but the uh, I've come to realize, though, uh, one, of, one of my early readings was uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead and discussion of the bardos. And uh, that's where I came to realize I believe that that earthworm I view is a very common uh, uh, ground that we, that we can go through. And in many ways, it can be a form of you know, purgatory. It can be a challenge to our belief systems. Uh, I know that Robert Monroe, you know, who is renowned for his work with uh, binaural beat brainwave entrainment in enhancing out-of-body experiences. Um, he thought that there were belief system territories and that people could actually get stuck 
uh, in those realms. And I, I would say that uh, that certainly could be the case. But uh, I've come to see that earthworm eye view as a much more natural and potentially very common ingredient of these kinds of experiences and certainly nothing to be feared. Uh, one thing I loved about the way that, um, say, dream yoga and some of the Tibetan dream work to prepare people for dying uh, often would envision that some of these kind of apparent demonic uh, creatures that you would encounter in the bardos were in many ways kind of uh, alternate reflections of self. And so in many ways, they were never, uh, you know, a demon or troll that was there to really get us as much as an ally, but clothed in that kind of uh, view of, of hardship, illness, injury, the things that seem uh, disagreeable in life. And yet, as I described earlier in our conversation, uh, like my meningitis can come to be befriended as a beautiful gift. Uh, and that's how I've come to kind of appreciate that Bardo's state or that earth for my view as being much more healing and friendly uh, and not just the uh, apparent kind of darkness and, and murk uh, uh, and glum of, uh, you know, my initial experience with it. But something that, uh, like most of my experience, including the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, I embrace because it's the whole experience that really has brought growth and transformation. So I think you've you've hit the nail on the head that earth where my view is a very crucial place to kind of appreciate and embrace as part of the journey. And then there's this beautiful gateway valley that you describe in, in great detail. And I gather you're mostly looking at it from up above on the wing of, of a butterfly is your description, one of millions of butterflies. And you're there with uh, your guide, whom you later learned was your actual birth sister that you never met in life. But uh, did you ever actually enter the valley? other than kind of flying above it. And, uh, and when you say butterfly, I don't think you actually mean an insect. No, it was, uh, I mean, this could have been a flying carpet. I mean, this could have been, uh, you know, this was not, uh, some people, uh, you know, want it to just be, uh, you know, an insect. Well, it's so much more than that. Uh, and I love, for example, I remember, uh, early on, people would challenge me and say, well, you know, this metaphor of the butterfly is a bit overused. And I'd, I'd say, well, you know, if you read Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's early work um, in her book, I think it's on death and dying uh, or life after death. Uh, she describes as a nursing student in 1945, within weeks of the liberation of Dachau, the uh, concentration camp, she was there visiting. And uh, shocked by what she saw, as was everyone else who was opening up those camps and, you know, soon after they were open. But she visited one of the barracks that had housed a lot of children. Uh, and she saw where they carved butterflies in the wood inside this barracks. And she wondered for a long period of her life, you know, what is it about the butterflies? And I've heard about them in many other contexts. For example, when the tornado hit Joplin, Missouri and, and killed many people you know, 10 years or so ago, um, when they were doing a healing mural downtown, a lot of the children would draw these little kind of winged butterfly creatures, uh, angel creatures that they said had rescued them and told them where to hide when the tornado was killing everybody. And, you know, we need to stop just kind of viewing these as a metaphor and, re and realize that these kind of winged diaphanous uh, uh, kind of fluttering uh, things like a magic carpet or an energetic uh, kind of butterfly appearance with colors beyond the rainbow doesn't have to be just an insect. And, but in the spiritual realm, in the world of ideals, it can be much more than that. Uh, and it's not just about symbols. This is about uniting uh, across the various levels of reality, our ability to understand, conceptualize, explain, and understand it. Uh, and so for me, that the butterfly, uh, it easily could have been a magic carpet. I mean, I don't remember it even having a head or face like a, an insect would have. Uh, but, you know, it's what I remembered was this incredible richness of these beautiful fl fluttering butterflies and that I happened to occupy one of them. Uh, that was an interesting feature. But also important to point out, and when you ask, did I walk in the valley? So I've said I had no, no body awareness at any point. But again, I will remind you of this whole concept of knowledge through identification, where I would become 
bigger and bigger aspects of the scene at large. And so I often would describe these sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools and these billowing clouds of, of pure color. And also my kind of amazement that as much as I'm a giant fan of astronomy, I have a telescope, I've always looked at the stars <clears throat> and felt this tremendous fondness for the night sky, uh, there were no stars in that sky. Uh, in that world, there, there was not even a sun. The, 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 the light was from billowing clouds of pure color. So it was a very different world than, than one I might have anticipated. And yet it's the world that I experienced that in many ways was a tremendous gift. And uh, from my perspective, overlaps tremendously with so many of the other stories I've heard. But that's where uh, so much of it has to do with kind of this heart sense of communication. It's what people are explaining about kind of oneness and a binding force of love and these kind of deep, uh, kind of emotionally engaging uh, um, perspectives and properties of that realm that are so important and that to me are what kind of bring a sense of of uh, of unity and of um, of kind of collaboration across these experiences uh, in an effort to explain them all. Quite a bit of the mediumistic literature uh, of the afterlife talks about a, a realm that's sometimes called the Summerland which is close to the physical plane and very much like the physical plane. Uh, and it's sort of an intermediate place where newly deceased uh, spirits uh, can reside for a while. They're very comfortable with the surroundings. Everything feels familiar uh, until they move on. And in fact, in the movie we mentioned earlier, No Solar, there's actually a, a city. It has hospitals. It has an administration building. It has parks. It's almost like the physical plane. Uh, is, do you think that w would be akin to the Gateway Valley that you experienced? I would say absolutely. The Gateway Valley was a beautiful uh, kind of overlap of, of as, as the words I used earlier, Plato's world of ideals. I think for many of us, for a soul on a journey, this is kind of like the world of ideals. It's the world of potential and the world of actuality. That's why it can encompass things like life reviews, where you actually experience it with the emotional power of those around you who are affected by your actions and even your thoughts. And uh, so I, I would say that the, the thing people need to realize, though, um, is that that realm has tremendous potential for expression because it's got to contain all the possibilities uh, for sentient beings' experiences uh, throughout the cosmos. And, and we recognize certain resonant patterns. And that's why I would say that in general, uh, you know, our experience is one of, of kind of having human experience and shared human experience. And of course, that can involve things like pets, uh, things that uh, <clears throat> where, you know, in material world, we would also have an overlap of emotional connection. But those also work very well in the spiritual realm because of that resonance, because of that kind of constructive interference. And it's uh, like Plotinus, you know, like attracts like, that old saying from Greek philosophy. Uh, and I think that's how we identify uh, with loved ones. I'm, I'm convinced that's absolutely how I resonated with that beautiful uh, young woman on the butterfly wing, who I never knew in this life. But it was that deep sense of resonance of our connection uh, as biological siblings that allow, and, and we had much more that we shared, as, as I mentioned in the book, Proof of Heaven. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, that beautiful birth sister was lost to this world due to her struggles with alcohol. And I had had my own struggles with alcohol. So we had that kind of bonding uh, uh, event of our of our life and uh, life experience of uh, of that as one of our hurdles and energizes of our growth. And sadly, uh, you know, her physical life ended because of that. Mine, uh, I was, you know, I was a, I stopped drinking alcohol in 1991. I never had any trouble with it at work. But on my nights off, I tended to lean a little too heavily on that scotch. And, and that's why my family and I decided in 1991 I was going to stop drinking. And I, I've never looked back. I've never regretted it. I'm very grateful for it. It's part of my story I'm proud to share because I think it will help 
a lot of other people who struggle with alcohol and addiction uh, to see that there is a brighter pathway forward. Uh, but that resonance is such a, a key kind of ingredient. But I also talk in, in Proof of Heaven how uh, much of what you can witness in those realms can seem very, very foreign to human experience. And that's how I was having these incredible visions of very advanced civilizations uh, far beyond ours that were also participating in this journey of kind of uh, the mind of the universe kind of self-discovering its nature, which I think is the reason all this exists. Uh, is know thyself, and the universe has that directive uh, itself, and sentient beings participate in that process of, of revelation. Well, now, as you're describing it, though, I have to admit I'm a little confused as to the demarcation, if, if there was one, between this gateway valley and what you've described as the core realm. I, I would have assumed that past life reviews and visiting other civilizations was more part of the core realm rather than the gateway valley. Well, I actually witnessed the uh, flying fish and the uh, Indra's net visions uh, more in the core realm. And in the core, important to stress that my first passage into the core, I'd witness all of you know, higher dimensional multiverse collapsing into this complex oversphere that was there to serve as a teaching tool. Um, and, and, and at times I would become one with all of that. And that includes one with that uh, God force. Uh, in fact, I came away from this realizing that our very source of conscious awareness is the God force itself. And of course, that amazes people that humans can uh, diverge so radically from that infinitely loving, powerful uh, force of kindness and compassion. And yet that shows how far we have to go in order to learn the lessons that we're trying to learn here as as a, as you know, a sentient uh, species and trying to grow. Uh, but the core realm was was radically different because uh, remember that in, in approaching it, in, in traversing this uh, portal that was provided by the angelic choirs, um, all of all of dualities, good, bad, dark, light, masculine, feminine, et cetera, all the different kind of spectra of, of things that, uh, you know, make up this world of ours resolve into oneness. Uh, that's where that becoming one with that God force was so powerful and astonishing. And don't, uh, no one should think it was Evan Alexander's little ego mind that for a moment was in the driver's seat of this God force. It was really witnessing the beautiful love and compassion and kindness and acceptance of our spiritual home that is really there for us all. And it's something I often hear uh, described by indie ears about this kind of oneness, uh, this sense of uh, it all being as it should be. Uh, it's one of the reasons why many of them are, are so happy to just say, well, I'll stay here. I don't need to go back. And yet what I came to realize in those Ender, Ender's Net and Flying Fish uh, visions is we all come back. Uh, now, I believe that there's a certain amount of will on behalf of higher soul as to whether or not we reincarnate and how we reincarnate and if we incarnate, all those kind of questions. But I believe that uh, in many ways, our souls are chomping at the bit uh, to come back into these bodies, knowing that they'll be dumbed down, knowing that there is a process of program forgetting. Just as those uh, doctors like Ian Stevenson, Jim Tucker, the guys at UVA who have studied past life memories in children for more than six decades that are indicative of reincarnation, as they'll tell you, you have to harvest those memories before age five or six because they're natural processes that cover them over. So that most of us as adults don't have ready access to between life and past life memories. And yet young children do have fairly ready access to that. Uh, and I encourage parents or grandparents with access to such children, ask your child where they were before they were here. And don't give them any leading information, but just an open-ended question and see what kind of answers you get. Uh, but the core realm, uh, getting back to your question, was really uh, very, very different from this realm. The, the, the Gateway Valley in many ways was a gateway, and it, and it served as this kind of a, a transition uh, between this lowest material realm and those highest spiritual realms of oneness. Uh, and that, of course, explains why it could serve as where we reunite with souls of departed loved ones and higher soul, etc., 
uh, and plan next incarnations. But that core realm, I think, is also an essential part of the journey. And, and I would say, I mean, from my own perspective in assessing my journey, it's clear to me that mine was not, quote, complete. If it had been complete, I would have, in the spiritual realms, gotten to the point where I would have then recovered full memory of Eben Alexander's life and then gone through an Eben Alexander life review. And from my perspective, what I went through uh, was what I needed to help me kind of in my journey of understanding for now. Uh, but it was not going to be a completed life leading to death uh, because of the fact that I never got to that point of uh, harvest, reharvesting memories of Eben Alexander's soul journey and that life review. But it still provided uh, an incredible richness of experience, plus this extraordinary healing that really has no explanation in medicine uh, that helps me to bring a message back to this world uh, that extends my message to uh, humanity at large. So with regard to the Gateway Valley, if, if I understand correctly, it might be fair to say you, you became one with the whole valley uh, through this process of knowledge through identification, but you didn't really linger there particularly, yeah, I gather. You, you kept moving up to the core realm. Right. I would say my memory of it is that most of the actual lessons were in the core realm. And that also, remember, this is far beyond uh, our normal material realm of causality. It's far beyond our normal kind of sentient conceptions of dualisms and the various relationships and qualities that one encounters uh, in this world. And that pure oneness with the divine is something... I, I find I cannot really put it into words beyond that kind of a, a descriptor. And yet I, I encounter people who have had uh, uh, not only near-death experiences, but other very powerful, spontaneous, uh, spiritually transformative experiences who are right there. They're on the same page. They, they might not be able to put it into words, but I can tell you know, in discussing this with them and, and those kind of deep concepts of oneness, of love, of the binding force of love and of this unified consciousness, this notion of the one mind that we share, uh, that's where uh, it really starts to open up. And the other thing I'd, I'd like to remind people, you know, some people are uh, the some of the alleged debunkers and, and skeptics and deniers out there are vis very busy pointing out that another near death experiencer might not be on a butterfly wing with millions of other butterflies above, above a rich, verdant valley. And that's where I have to remind them that that spiritual realm has tremendous potential for setting a stage of you know, possibilities, actuality, and, and teaching points. And the analogy I often use is we could take 10 people right here and now, and we could teleport them randomly to drop into Paris, as an example. And, and then 12 hours later, we teleport them all back. They're all going to have radically different stories to tell. In fact, you would wonder if there's one Paris from all those different journeys, but it would depend on where they were in their soul journey, you know, what kind of questions they had in their mind, who they encountered, what was the actual setting of where they landed in Paris. And the spiritual realm has far more degrees of freedom than Paris, France. So just remember in trying to cross compare these stories, you're really looking pretty deep to some of the kind of fundamental themes and qualities uh, that people use to describe and convey them. Uh, and also important, I would say, to point out that our religious beliefs may kind of flavor the way we talk about an experience, but they don't dictate the content of the experience. And in my own personal example, for example, growing up in a Methodist church in North Carolina and then a, an adult in an Episcopal church up in Massachusetts and in Virginia, um, you know, the uh, there was never a concept of truly becoming one with God in the way that I did in my NDE and that I've heard other people describe in NDEs and that I believe is the deep truth, is it's a clue that that God force is at the very core of our conscious awareness. Uh, and likewise, reincarnation, that's never a thought that had crossed my mind as a possibility. And yet I came back from my NDE knowing it was true, but also not knowing that there was a tremendous wealth of scientific evidence 
supporting reincarnation. Uh, for example, the work out at uvadops.org, uh, University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, the work of Jim Matlock and other investigators who have looked at past life memories in children. I mean, the scientific literature on that topic is very rich indeed. And when you study it, you come away realizing, you know, of course, reincarnation happens. We, we don't understand it, but it's there as a fact of human existence. Uh, let's try and understand it better. And that's where I think this uh, revolution in consciousness and the science of consciousness is really going to change all of humankind. Coming back to the question of uh, the demarcation between the Gateway Valley and the core realm, I, I think you referred to looking up and seeing these luminescent billowing clouds. And I, I gather that that might be a kind of demarcation there. Well, that was actually mainly a part of the Gateway Valley. And really, the only demarcation I see between them was this uh, brilliant, undulating, uh, evanescent uh, kind of wormhole, a portal. Uh, in fact, if you ask me for the quality of its wall, I would say it appeared a lot like uh, the corona in a total solar eclipse. It was this shimmering kind of pearly opalescence uh, kind of um, interacting uh, uh, energy that served as a uh, you know, a pathway from one level to the next, but uh, kind of never the twain shall meet in terms of any overlap of the qualities. I mean, the, the core realm was absolutely different uh, from the Gateway Valley in its kind of purity of oneness. Uh, you know, I could sense the emerging uh, kind of details of, of what then comes out from that oneness uh, uh, through these spiritual realms and down to the dense uh, differentiations of the material realm. And yet, um, really, that portal provided an absolute uh, boundary between, uh, between the different layers. Uh, likewise, uh, the, the Gateway Valley and, and uh, the ascent up from the earthworm's eye view, from that lowest murky level, uh, there was that defining pathway that I can best describe as kind of a wormhole or portal uh, that was of this shimmering energetic light that connected them. Uh, but the rules were very different in these different territories. And that was especially obvious, even though the spiritual richness uh, and beauty and the sense of being at home in a spiritual home was similar in the Gateway Valley and in the core realm, uh, the core was uh, in many ways a resolution of, uh, of, of any kind of dualities and paradoxes, time flow, any bit of it, it all kind of came together in the core to where the core was much more this, this flow of pure oneness, but where at the edges you could differentiate that there were those kind of subtle little uh, emergences that would then going back down to these lower levels uh, relate to kind of differences that we perceive in kind of qualities, perceptions, all of that as you get down all the way to the dense density of the material world and all of its kind of differentiation. I also gather that as you entered into this portal, into the core realm, you were no longer on the wings of a butterfly with your beautiful birth sister there as your guide. That, that is true. And in fact, there's a place in Proof of Heaven where I even mention that uh, I could not say yes or no, but I mused over the possibility that that brilliant orb of light that I witnessed in the core, that to me uh, was a translator or interpreter. I know uh, in some of my early talks, I mentioned it could be a Christ energy, kind of Christ consciousness along the lines of Pierre Tillard de Chardin. But that brilliant orb of light was in the core. Uh, and I surmise that potentially the same kind of loving, welcoming intelligence that was uh, that guardian angel, my my uh, spiritual guide on the butterfly wing, that beautiful young woman, could have made the transition up into the next level as that interpreter. You know, that's my analytical overlay. I, you know, I can't say there's any strong piece of evidence from just the experience itself that would dictate that the loving intelligence of my birth sister serving as a spiritual guide in the Gateway Valley could transmute into this brilliant orb. I mean, to me, in trying to make sense of the experience, I looked at both of them as tremendously helpful and beneficial guides in that moment. 
of the beautiful woman on the butterfly wing in, in, the, in the Gateway Valley where such things were permitted. Uh, but then that same loving of, of sense of purpose, because that in essence was kind of the will of my higher soul to helping to usher me between these levels. Uh, but for me to surmise that it was her spirit as a separate spirit of benevolent guide to me, a helper, uh, could then transform into this brilliant orb uh, in the core realm. That's just analytical conjecture. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but the reality is they were very different forms of, uh, of an aiding energy that was there to help me in a very strong and personal fashion. Um, but the rest, uh, I, I would say, is just conjecture goes a little bit beyond what I could say is the immediate kind of recognition and acknowledgement of connections within the experience itself. I also presume that as you move through these realms, your sense of self, uh, of bodily self, remained the same, that there was, was never a body of any kind. There was never a body of any kind. Uh, and that, you know, that differs from some other uh, NDE, certainly. Um, but for me, it was it was perfectly natural and it allowed for very facile uh, kind of shifting of energy and moving between these these levels and of, of, of harvesting the lessons uh, from each and every le level. But I would say most of the deep lessons uh, were bundled in the core realm. Uh, and of course, that's where returning to this process through meditation, I think, has been beneficial uh, because I use meditation. As you mentioned earlier, I try to meditate an hour to a day. I use sacred acoustics, uh, differential frequency brainwave entrainment, although I, I'm convinced that by using it daily for more than a decade, my overall kind of mental processing when I'm here in the body in this normal awake state participating in our consensus reality is quite different than it used to be uh, because I believe meditation can help uh, to make us much more facile uh, as higher souls interacting with those higher levels at all times, uh, which is one of the real benefits of meditation. Uh, but I've gleaned a lot through these this ensuing, you know, four, almost 14 years of, of exploration uh, to reunite with uh, with uh, the various entities and guides uh, that I, I've met in those spiritual realms in my NDE and then in meditations involving the NDE later. Well, that's interesting, the phrase spirits and, and guides. So uh, your birth sister was your guide in the Gateway Valley. Uh, there were other guides, I gather, in the core realm. Yes, in the core realm, it was um, really that brilliant orb of light uh, that served as kind of an interpreter or translator. And you know, initially that seemed to be a necessary part of it all because on initially entering the core, uh, in spite of having the higher dimensional multiverse through all of eternity, there is this kind of teaching tool. Uh, I felt the majesty and awe and power and the personal uh, beauty of that connection with that God force, that wholeness, that oneness, that uh, loving. It was like being home. I mean, to me, that's the part that bears uh, most uh, 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 emphasizing is that, uh, you know, we can sound foreign to use these words to describe this kind of a journey. And yet I felt like it was the most beautiful, welcoming, wonderful thing for my soul. It was fitting right in there with this perfect sense of resonance and, and very reassuring and comforting. But of course, that's why uh, it's also interesting that so many in that environment will then go on to make a decision to come back to this world, which is usually done out of that sense of responsibility. Uh, but I think it's important to point out that very powerful ambience of uh, incarnation and then progressive incarnations, because I, I worry that s some people uh, you know, take uh, this literature and uh, actually use it as an excuse if they're dissatisfied with this life to kill themselves. And there couldn't be a bigger mistake than uh, to commit suicide, because then those same issues that challenged one in this life, I believe, uh, come back repackaged and they have to face them in, in a next life. So better, you know, and, and I love that uh, in conversation with Raymond Moody shared with me that one of the most uh, uh, one of the clearest things he's discerned from his five decades of studying this field 
is that if anybody tries to commit suicide and has any of the major elements of an NDE, the love, the uh, connecting with departed loved ones, etc., they come back to this world, they will not attempt suicide again. And I think that's an important lesson for all who were worried about suicide, a loved one who's committed suicide and was successful at it. Because what it shows us is the journey they go through is one where they discover that beautiful love that was present for them in this incarnation that they were unable to recognize. And I think it, it's an important thing to stress because uh, it hurts me no end to hear of people committing suicide, trying to get to that better world only to realize that then they have to, you know, basically go through life review and whatever cannot be resolved in that life review has to be repackaged into the challenges of a next life. Um, we, we're here. This is where we get the work done is in these lives. Um, and the life review can serve as a course correction. But I love how my partner, Karen Newell, says, why not just do a daily review? Uh, and that's she's kind of got me into that practice in a big way to where I try and make amends every day, uh, you know, for any wrongs I perceive I may have done to someone in the past, uh, you know, and, and when necessary, calling them up, what have you. But in meditation, I can do a higher soul to higher soul uh, kind of forgiveness and, and seeking a, a amends and what have you, uh, and really try and, and repair my kind of soul journey as I go. I think the the daily review makes far more sense than saving it all up for a life review. So that, I gather, is also part of your meditation practice. Absolutely. And it's uh, one where in, in meditation, if I'm having a conflict with someone or if there's something I, I would like the world to better address, I go right there in my meditation. And I, I do a, a, something that she taught me so well which is to feel the emotional truth of success in that endeavor. And when in meditation, I feel that in my heart, that successful completion of whatever it is I'm trying to bring to the world uh, or to another person's life or healing to someone else or what have you, whatever it might be. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I just put it out to the universe like that. And there, there are times when I, I sense that it really uh, does a tremendous amount of good and really uh, kind of helps this uh, world. Uh, there are times when I sense that it's frustrating, like all the prayers I'm uh, putting in with my daily meditations now to peace in Ukraine. Uh, and I feel very frustrated that what in my meditative space feels successful and like I'm getting there. Uh, but then I come back to this world and uh, I face the reality that I don't seem to be accomplishing anything near what I feel like I'm getting done in meditation. Well, one of the points that you made about this other realm, I think starting with the Gateway Valley or maybe even the Earthworm's viewpoint is deep time. The idea that the time that we experience here is very, very different from the time you experience there. So I imagine that in the, in the realm of deep time, the Ukraine war, for example, would be very different than it seems to us here and watching it on television. Well, that is a very good point. And uh, I mean, to elaborate on this concept of deep time, I think it's most important just to remind people of that life review, uh, because the life review is most often described um, as a reliving of events in a very detailed fashion, and often in a way where you actually have a, a, some power over kind of shifting the, the outcome in terms of the emotional uh, kind of result of the interaction with others. And that's where a life review can serve as kind of a course correction to help in planning next incarnations. It's not just kind of a dead zone of harvesting sepia-tinted memories, uh, but actually a living dynamic interaction that shows you that at that level of spiritual awareness, the universe is allowing us to relive these various events. And the other thing you find is that no matter how short an NDE is from Earth time, say a cardiac arrest that just lasts for a few minutes, and then somebody's clinically dead, but then they're resuscitated, but they have what they describe as a very complete life review. It's not like people come back and sense that they're, uh, they missed certain elements or certain major features of it that needed to happen. I mean, most people are commenting 
on the extraordinary kind of completeness of that life review. And I think uh, that's an important point. But what it's telling us is that at that stage, when you're sufficiently outside of the here and now space time and the sense of self that we have when we're in these bodies, uh, but in that very liberating kind of higher state of, of vibration, we have access to all the events of our life. And uh, that can also include past lives and, uh, you know, a bigger kind of consolidation, although generally life reviews are described as focused on the recent incarnation. Uh, but I think that that's uh, that's a very important point that um, that it's uh, a deep time is just conveying the notion that Earth time, what we experience here in living these lives in our material bodies is in many ways a fiction. It's a stage setting that allows a drama to unfold. But that's why viewed from the uh, spiritual perspective of, you know, uh, an NDE or a shared death experience or uh, uh, the process of dying, like in, in Christopher Kerr's work, uh, where you find that in hospice work, the very same kind of encounters are happening where uh, souls of departed loved ones are coming to escort people over. To me, that's an imprimatur that means it's an authentic, real experience. If the loved one is is coming, that uh, uh, my mother had the very same thing happen when she, at age 99 in April of, of 2019, she left the physical world and the last four days of her life, she had a respiratory infection that basically rendered her unresponsive. So she was lying in bed completely unresponsive to stimuli uh, with a fever and uh, with this uh, pulmonary infection that was trying to claim her life. Uh, but two nights before she passed, in the middle of this four-day period, she woke up. And she woke her nurse up and it was 2.30 in the morning. And she said, call my children. My mother's here. My mother's here. And to her, it was absolutely real. And I've heard enough of those stories and been through my own experiences enough to realize that was real. Her mother's soul was there. Uh, and that was what got her going. And I wish that um, nurse had called us. I wish she'd called me, certainly, at 2.30 in the morning. I wouldn't have minded one bit. Uh, but that's what my mother was going through. And then she lapsed back into her unresponsive state where she was for the next uh, two days or so. And then she passed from this world. But the fact that she saw her mother uh, was the powerful uh, indicator of reality uh, of these these kind of adventures. And uh, and that's what she was going through at the time. Uh, and to me, it was very comforting because I knew her time was near, but I also knew she was on the right path. Uh, and that her mother would serve as a beautiful guide. I had, had another example of that kind of terminal lucidity in the book Proof of Heaven. And it happened to a friend of mine who happened to be the uh, chairman of one of the top neurosurgical programs on Earth. Uh, and so he was, like me, a card-toting reductive materialist scientist. And when he saw his own father go through this uh, uh, terminal lucidity, uh, the father had been progressively comatose for weeks, was just about to die. And my friend was at the bedside when the father came back to life and was astonished to see the soul of his own mother. That would be the grandmother of my friend uh, at the bedside, uh, at the foot of the bed and, and having this animated discussion with her. Uh, and, uh, and it was clear to my friend that she, her soul was there, even though he could not perceive her. He was absolutely convinced by the, what he saw in his father. And then his father died with this beautiful smile on his face. Welcome back. And my friend went for a, a year and a half, not understanding that experience until I was visiting, uh, that campus and had a discussion with him about my own experience when he went, Oh my God, now I get it. But that, that uh, seeing departed souls of loved ones who have left the physical world is, is a hallmark of NDEs going back thousands of years. You mentioned earlier, Eben, that you didn't have the life review yourself of your life as Eben Alexander, but I gather, especially from the flying fish experience you reported, you, you may have had a life review of other past lives. Well, what I saw was um, the the process of life review and of reincarnation was all bundled together in those two visions very strongly, the, the flying fish and the Ender's net vision to where I, I came back to this world having absolutely no doubt 
of the reality of reincarnation, of the eternity of soul and of consciousness. But then, of course, it was just a, a challenge to try and understand it all and come up with a, you know, a scientific belief system that would allow for all of that to be uh, to be the case. Um, but I don't in in the in the visions I had, uh, I did not see anything that I would label as an Eben Alexander past life uh, review. That was not something I saw. And I think it's because my uh, I was still basically cloaked to my life as Eben Alexander until I got to that point in the transition. Uh, and, you know, it was an open ended question how all this would turn out and uh you know, whether I would succumb to the men meningitis and go on to die uh, from this body or not. And uh, just the way it all unfolded, I was to come back to this world. But that did not involve any memories I had from from that experience that I could, uh, you know, label as uh, uh, past life reviews for Evan Alexander's life. Well, what about previous past lives? They, that was nothing that I saw in those visions. Now, I have had uh, what I interpret as past life, <clears throat> uh, potentially past life uh, visions in many of my meditations. So in trying to reconnect with, uh, with my NDE, I have encountered uh, visions. And, and those, uh, I've, I mean, I've had visions that go all the way back to life in caves and of seacoast. Uh, life on the prairie and, you know, in wagon trains, um, other visions like that. The problem I have with them, and, and some of them can be very real. I remember one uh, probably about uh, two and a half, three years ago that was very strong of, of, of working in the uh, mass and uh, uh, sail rigging of a tall ship coming out of a harbor in this brilliant sunlit day with seagulls all around me and just this incredibly rich uh, vision um, but then, uh, you know, what do I make of that? How do I take that knowledge? Uh, and, and what I do is I try and explore it in meditation uh, and try and explore out from the memories and, and see where that'll lead. And, and so, yes, I've had in that process of using meditation, uh, especially differential frequency brainwave uh, enhanced uh, meditation uh, to engage with past life memories. But I really have trouble then trying to uh, kind of glean the details of that, that I can then chase down objectively in, in a Google search or what have you to try and track that history down and confirm it. To me, that's been the, the challenging kind of loose end of that kind of an adventure. Uh, I mean, I'm convinced from uh, some of what I've experienced in these um, uh, meditative experiences, uh, a very real, uh, alive, uh, you know, uh, scenes where it's a complete uh, uh, unification of sensory modalities in terms of memory. And yet uh, I still have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, harboring all of that in the sense of past life memories that then contribute to my deeper understanding of my soul journey, uh, you know, from this point forward. I suppose I would have to say the same myself. I've had, I would call them flashes, where maybe for a brief moment I'm in another time and place. But the whole story of that lifetime, uh, if it was a past lifetime, hasn't emerged for me uh, at all. Well, I think that there's, there's a lot to that, and I keep looking. And uh, the other thing I think to point out to people is that journaling is important here. As I often say, the the answer might come before the question, uh, but you really have to be looking at the big picture and these patterns, uh, you know, the patterns that come and some of the uh, the kind of depth of, of, of the experience can be quite remarkable. And, and, you know, you think, oh, my gosh, that had so much richness and detail to it. It's got to be something that I'm, I'm actually accessing through memory. Uh, and yet to me so far. Uh, I don't have, uh, you know, a, uh, a narrative that really ties those pieces together. And I think it's just I really need to do, do more deep meditative work uh, and let the universe show me more. But this is this is where the real value of meditation and realizing that our pathways to knowledge do not always 
of just follow that linguistic brain and it's following the breadcrumbs, you know, from point A to point B to point C in terms of our understanding. But that in many ways, the universe can give us, uh, uh, you know, tremendous kind of uh, consolidation of these uh, patterns of information uh, that we can work with. And that's where journaling is very important and kind of keeping an open mind to this and also using a meditation to ask the universe for what you need uh, the next time around. In other words, I use a given meditation and its results and its kind of mysteries and question marks uh, to serve as seeds for the next meditation and find that often then the universe starts to weave uh, this story that uh, can come together for me. But in terms of a strong sense of past life connections, I'm still uh, assembling all of that from meditative experience. You also mentioned that while you were in this core realm, you had the experience of other advanced civilizations, far more advanced than ours. Yes, and that was one of the most beautiful things that I actually saw kind of in connection to why all this is happening. And it had to do with the why of my journey and kind of the why of the awakening, why of the healing that I went through. Uh, and all that is in very much tied to what I believe is kind of that higher sense of, of purpose for the journey. And that is for the awakening of all of humankind. Uh, you know, we've been in this uh, deep slumber that I would say is our illusion of, of understanding of reality based in this false sense of separation, uh, based in a lot of what materialist science has told us about the nature of the universe, uh, and certainly a lot of the successes of science and technology, say successes in medicine, successes in communication and transportation, I would say are quite obvious. Uh, but then again, there's that dark underbelly of modern science and technology, our addiction to fossil fuels, our uh, uh, addiction to you know burning biomass and fossil fuels and uh, uh, filling the world with carbon dioxide, uh, warming the planet up beyond levels that uh, can sustain life as we know it, um, the economic greed, corporate greed at the top. Uh, a lot of this is, I would say, due to this false sense of separation that comes from materialism. And also, uh, parallel with that was uh, a kind of a misinterpretation of Darwinian selection. And whereas biologists back in the 20th century might have focused on competition as being one of the big rules of Darwinian evolution, <clears throat> I would say that most biologists have come to recognize that collaboration and cooperation both between members of a species and between species, is truly the hallmark of successes in the modern biological world. And it's not so much that naked focus on, on competition uh, and limited resources, but a much more kind of open-ended view of how life can benefit life and evolve in very powerful ways. And that's where I think this new quantum informed science of consciousness takes us a long way towards seeing how uh, this one mind hypothesis, uh, you know, that we're all sharing one mind can be a tremendous catalyst to helping humanity come together and grow more into uh, notions of kindness, forgiveness, uh, uh, compassion uh, and love, unconditional love is a force of healing. And I would say when I look around our world at large today, all the political polarization, certainly war, uh, warfare and violent conflict in, in many settings, uh, I see that underbelly of science and technology leading us away from interpreting this as the actions of homo sapiens. Sapiens means wise. Uh, and certainly there is some wisdom in our science and technology, but the overall impact of what it's doing, when, especially when I look at the extinction of, of many animal systems, plant systems on this planet today, something like 45% of insect species are threatened with extinction. That should alarm all of us. Our entire agricultural industry and food industry will collapse without pollinating insects. And yet here we are as this wise species with our misguided efforts to uh, kind of dominate this world, leading to extinction of a lot of plants and animals that are essential for our very survival. And that's where I believe my kind of witnessing of these advanced civilizations that I reported in Proof of Heaven 
was seeing in many ways that uh, the evolution of, of humanity at this point in time is about joining that much bigger club. And that club is a very knowledgeable indeed, because the civilizations I saw were far beyond any kind of enslavement to our concepts of space and time and of uh, entrapment within any, any levels of a four dimensional universe, but a far grander <clears throat> kind of ability of exploration and extension of will and understanding and of influence. And that if we are to join that club, we are to we must become much wiser uh, in the near term. Uh, and that's why I do believe that, that in fact, this uh, kind of uh, the UFO initiative, you know, as we've seen in recent months, how the Pentagon has per, per, pretty much come out and said, yep, uh, these military sightings of UFOs are real. We don't know exactly what they are, but they are absolutely real events. Uh, there is some intelligence out there uh, flying these vehicles around in ways that are far beyond our technology. Get used to it, people. Um, and I think that all of this is related. I think, uh, in fact, I know um, when I uh, I had some good opportunities to talk with Edgar Mitchell when I stayed with him, the Apollo 14 astronaut who became a close friend. Um, and I know he discussed with me some of his thoughts about uh, about extraterrestrials and, and the role that they, they might be playing in trying to help humanity. Uh, and I believe a lot of that is what is going on. And the problem is we really need to help ourselves. We cannot be a warfaring civilization uh, trying to export warfare into the cosmos. That's why I think concepts like the Space Force are horribly misguided. Warfare is something that should die here and now on Earth and never be exported to the heavens. It would be tragedy of the highest order for Homo sapiens to take warfare into space. We need to kill it dead here on this Earth and start uh, harboring peace uh, and uh, friendship, uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, love for our fellow species. This is what humanity needs to do in, in awakening and growing. And to join that club, which I think uh, was banging on our door, we really must mature to a much higher level of operation with each other. Well, I'm gathering from what you're saying that really yeah, each and every one of us is potentially connected telepathically at that level with other civilizations throughout the galaxy, probably throughout the whole universe of trillions of galaxies that uh, have solved many of the problems or perhaps all the problems that we are now facing ourselves. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And um, that's where this evolution of consciousness can be very important. Now, Again, remembering that principle of like attracts like and resonance, constructive interference, uh, it's harder for us to recognize in journeying these spiritual realms, you know, the kind of aspects of civilizations that are very, very, very far removed from what we experience here as humans in this civilization. But they're not inaccessible. And I believe uh, that we can through meditation, through uh, traversing these kind of uh, the veiling function of the brain, I think that we can access far greater wisdom. It, in many ways, it kind of reminds me of techniques that have been used uh, for centuries, you know, with very creative people. For example, Albert Einstein, he would float around in a sailboat looking up at the sky daydreaming. Sometimes the harbor police up on Long Island would have to haul his sailboat in. Uh, but that's where he would glean some of his deepest ideas about this. He wasn't necessarily just following the breadcrumbs and mathematical formulas at his desk, but he was doing thought experiments and opening his mind to let the universe show him the answer. Likewise, Thomas Alva Edison, one of the greatest inventors of all time, who worked, uh, founded GE and uh, uh, still holds the record, I think, for patents uh, by a GE inventor, uh, but he had a technique where late at night when he was looking for inspiration and ideas, he'd hold some weights in his hands, and as he fell asleep, his hands would drop and it would wake him up. 
And after three or four of these micro naps, he'd jump back into the game of a creative invention because that's what opened the floodgates for him, getting into that hypnagogic space of, you know, between awake and asleep. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson had a similar technique that he would use for uh, enhancing his uh, ideas for music, poetry, uh, novels, things like that. Salvador Dali, uh, Beethoven, they all had ways of getting into this hypnagogic state. And so they're not just following the little linear, logical, rational, linguistic brain that's trying to lead them to answers, but they're seeking, you know, reaching out to the universe through the dream space, through that broader space of the mental realm uh, for seeds of creativity and insight. And that's where I believe all of us can participate through meditation. Uh, if all you really need is a, a powerful way for turning off that little monkey mind voice so it doesn't just chatter, chatter, chatter away and wreck your uh, attempts at meditation and with coming into connection with that one mind across the veil. Um, and that's where I believe uh, meditation can be tremendously uh, helpful in this effort by opening up those channels and pathways towards kind of higher knowing and uh, solutions that have worked elsewhere in the universe and allowing them to flow into our uh, presence and knowledge in facing the challenges and problems that we face as individuals and as society at large. I know there are some people of a traditional bent who, who would say there's also a danger that we might in meditation get attracted to the dark side, to, to the demonic, to forces that are regressive rather than progressive. And, and it would tempt people to evil. So therefore, it's, it's better just to live your everyday life and not to try and enter into the depths of consciousness. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I tend to default to the ambience in the background as described by near-death experiencers going back thousands of years. And that is a background where the when you encounter the universe at those deep and profound kind of originating levels of, of creativity and of understanding, um, you encounter a, a world of love, compassion, kindness, acceptance, mercy, of all being in this together. Uh, I mean, near-death experiencers almost universally come back to this world knowing that we're here to take care of each other and that love is very healing, and that the more we can manifest love for others, the more we're serving to love ourselves. Uh, and it's not as if you get deep into the literature of NDEs and you find that at the deepest uh, levels of reality, there's this giant battle between good and evil, and wow, the forces of evil are really strong, and oh, they might even win this battle. No, you don't see a hint of it. I talked about that in Proof of Heaven. I talked about how evil is present in trace amounts. And, and what that does is it provides that gradient, that kind of differential that, that allows us the gift of free will to make choices, you know, to align, uh, you know, with one way or the other, yes or no. How do we respond to these questions from the universe? And once you realize that at the deepest levels of exploration, that occur in these uh, spontaneous near-death experiences going back thousands of years, <clears throat> you realize the background is one of love, that ultimately what you find there is a comforting force of, of love and compassion that is our spiritual home, that welcomes us into that realm. We're welcomed there by loved ones who have died. Their physical bodies died. They left the physical plane, and yet they come to us with these messages of love, smiling, happiness, joy, bliss. This is the nature of our connection. And to me, that is the nature of exploration of those realms. You might try and drag it evil in there, uh, but the ultimate reality is to be most successful in navigating these realms, in learning from them, in kind of a feeling, a sense of connection, in terms of gleaning information, in terms of seeking influence on our emerging reality. You find that it is all happening in a world of love, compassion, oneness, where the highest good for all involved is the goal. 
And that's where I believe, uh, you know, my worry about someone taking dark and evil into meditative practice and using it for some nefarious scheme uh, where they're trying to harvest the energy of that realm to do bad to others, you'll find it doesn't work because the rules of that realm guide us inexorably towards this oneness, love, compassion, kindness, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness mode of being. That's why NDEers come back that way. You know, even if you look at the three to five percent of NDEs that are negative, hellish NDEs, as they're called, uh, what they often involve is someone who has an unpleasant life review. You know, if you're busy handing out a ton of pain and suffering to others, you know, when your life review rolls around and you have to be on the receiving end of that, it's not necessarily a lot of fun. They do come back transformed and they come back transformed for the better. They come back believing in an afterlife. They come back believing that there is a beneficent God force that is there. They don't come back, oh yeah, the devil was right. I need to follow where he was leading me. They come back going, no, absolutely not. So uh, I really don't have any fear that some human being, some sentient being is going to try and drag their very negative, conflicted, ego-driven uh, kind of anti-human sentiments into that realm and get away with it. Uh, because just by touching and bathing in that realm, you end up coming back transformed for the better in the direction of positive growth, which is where I think this awakening for all of humanity will take all of us. Uh, but you know, the answer is still uh, uh, unknown as to whether we will continue with our status quo, uh, you know, falsely believing that homo sapiens that is raping and pillaging the world through greed and avarice and kind of a, a mindless application of, of our technology in ways that destroys the planet, uh, we don't know yet if we'll awaken from that slumber that has allowed us to drift so deeply into a climate emergency. I would imagine if one were to be in telepathic contact with other civilizations, there there will be other civilizations that uh, have destroyed themselves by not resolving the kinds of problems we're facing today, and as well as other civilizations uh, that were destroyed accidentally, let us say, through meteors and comets and, and the like. Well, I think that's a very good point. And I've often thought that um, uranium-235, which is the fissionable um, uh, isotope of uranium that can be used to make weapons, um, given that the discovery of that in our culture, and I would argue might happen in other cultures, is at the same time that you discover rocket propulsion and the ability to leave a planet and go out uh, into space and take your species out there further— that that is no accident, that in fact the uranium-235 is there as a filter so that any sufficiently warlike civilization will blow itself up before it intoxicates and pollutes the rest of the universe by spreading, you know, this kind of evil self-centered uh, uh, kind of way of living out to the cosmos. Uh, it's one of the, in fact, uh, I, I remember hearing uh, just this week somebody putting kind of a negative spin on on this, the whole question of why we don't obviously have um, made contact with extraterrestrials to date. Uh, although I would say that I think the, the contact is pretty obvious, but some people still refuse to believe it. Uh, but it's not widely obvious to the world at large that we made that contact. And they were putting forth the proposition that maybe that was because most civilizations blew themselves up before they wandered out into space. And I certainly hope that's not the case. Uh, I do believe I have more hope in uh, intelligence and in uh, evolving species and widely different planetary systems uh, that uh, I'm a little more optimistic that they would not just all commit uh, a stupid uh, suicide as opposed to uh, perpetuating their intelligence and truly coming into wisdom uh, with their ongoing evolution. But uh, uh, for humanity, uh, the answer is still before us. We have to wait and see. Will we wake up in time to reverse the climate uh, calamity that we're, we're generating for ourselves right now? When you were experiencing deep time, the answer wasn't apparent. 
Well, in deep time, uh, it was visible that all of these things are simply serving as uh, kind of energizers and catalysts uh, to help us move towards uh, wholeness, come into wholeness. And that's where my optimism comes from. Because I believe that that wholeness involves a successful, intelligent, truly wise homo sapiens and not one that fails miserably by uh, self-destruction. Um, but, you know, the, the answer is not yet in. We'll have to wait and see how it goes. But I fully believe that this awakening, and, and in my mind, there's no question the scientific community has gone through tremendous uh, kind of evolution in the last decade or so around this question of consciousness and the nature of reality. In many ways, I would say we're, uh, we're getting much closer uh, to a deep and profound truth that in my mind has been in the works for the better part of 5,000 or more years of human evolution and destiny. Uh, and, and again, I'm very optimistic about where it's headed, but that optimism is not rooted in the status quo of continuing the way we are, but actually waking up and realizing uh, just how misguided our materialist and egocentric drives have led us into uh, uh, potential cataclysm. But I believe that, uh, you know, in, in, in any discussion of, say, addiction and alcoholism, uh, you find that there is uh, that concept of the gift of desperation, that uh, you got to hit a low enough bottom to energize you to kind of change your behavior and rise off that bottom and grow into a much more kind of transformed and positive self moving forward and away from those negative, addictive, suicidal, self-destructive kind of impulses. And in many ways, what a materialist science has gifted us with is a collective gift of desperation. And that's in the form of climate change and the violence and the political conflict and uh, the economic polarization, concentration of wealth in the hands of just a few at the expense of the vast multitudes. I mean, there are many things wrong with this egotistical uh, kind of self-centered view of materialism and where it's led us. The very fact that we live in a world that has billionaires and yet it also has more than a billion children who are going to bed hungry every night. That is like oil and water. That should not mix. The two should not coexist. And yet they do in our society. There's some magic uh, where the billionaires are allowed to thrive and concentrate their billions while all those children are going to bed hungry and many other people hungry too. And I believe that that in many ways is kind of a litmus test of where our world stands. And we really need to wake up and realize that's a horrific uh, misdirection of resources when you allow all those starving children or children in, in warfare, uh, things like that, when we have the power to change it. Uh, and there's the wealth to go around. It's just that when it's concentrated in so few hands, uh, it really, its power is lost. And that's where I think we need a system that does a more equitable distribution of wealth that acknowledges all of our abilities to kind of contribute to this world at large, but also acknowledges that all are worthy souls uh, and that we really shouldn't be uh, eliminating the resources uh, that uh, allow for, uh, you know, a basic existence for all souls alive in this world today. Eben, I know when we were in Vail together, I told the story of uh, an after-death communication, or some might call it a shared death experience I had 50 years ago that changed my life. And one of the primary qualities I recall from that experience is that upon awakening, I, because it was a lucid dream experience, I was crying tears of joy and singing a, a very sacred song from my religious background. And uh, I wonder in your experience uh, about the emotional component. Uh, as a speck of awareness, uh, were you also experiencing emotions? Well, that's a very good question. And I would say I was experiencing emotions, but in many ways it almost seems like it was kind of guarded. 
Uh, and that, that has to do with my engagement with the whole process. And for much of it, I felt like I was kind of being shown around, driven around. You know, I mentioned that spiritual guide on the butterfly wing, the beautiful woman. I mentioned the spiritual guidance I received from that beautiful orb of light in the core. Um, but it was not generally a process of my willing what happened next. It was more like I was being shown, uh, shown these things. Uh, emotions were certainly a part of it. Uh, and, and, and that's where I would say, for example, the, the deep connection that I sensed with my spiritual guide, with that young woman on the butterfly wing was one of profound kind of resonance of my emotional state with hers. And that was, that was it. It was not some cognitive or intellectual knowledge of a shared reality, uh, as much as a deep sense of emotional connection with her. Uh, and, and I would say emotions were very much activated also, uh, in various aspects of the core realm. Um, but, but any kind of lack of my, uh, sense of emotion throughout the uh, entire experience, I, I would say is tied to, uh, the fact that I didn't have an Eben Alexander engagement with it. You know, as we've said, that amnesia was part of the lessons I was to learn. I only came to realize that in the months and years afterward. Uh, and certainly, I would say, in my uh, work with meditation, to reconnect with uh, with uh, various aspects of my NDE, with those spiritual guides, entities, with that infinite force of love, uh, a, a, a very strong fo focus on the emotional uh, connection has been crucial uh, and not to be denied. In fact, I think that's one place where some scientists uh, in this discussion of consciousness might be misled and start thinking that the emotions lead you away from the truth in such a journey. They're looking for the intellectual truth that could emerge from that kind of conscious exploration and deep meditation. And what I would argue is you're, you're, that's a fool's errand to try and harvest lessons from deep uh, dives into the spiritual realm through kind of intellectual pursuit and analysis alone. I think that's very kind of misguided, and it's really going in there. I I would liken it to what where Karen, my uh, partner and a spiritual guide in much of my work, enlightened me about this notion of heart consciousness, because there I was, you know, in the early months and years after my coma experience, as this Harvard neurosurgeon trying to discuss brain and mind and consciousness in a way that made sense, and I kept defaulting to kind of my scientific background and that kind of language and discussion. And she would remind me, it's always about the heart and heart consciousness and emotion. And she was absolutely right. And it was something that became very real to me in my meditative experiences to focus on that heart connection and on that emotional engagement with anything that I was encountering in the meditative space. And that certainly includes um, in the setup for meditation, where my linguistic brain and my ego mind might still be active to state a request, make, uh, you know, state an intention, uh, ask a question, what have you. Uh, that is all done from kind of a heart consciousness perspective. Uh, and it's really in that emotional sphere of engagement that I think the most useful information emerges. The other thought I have is uh, based on my study of the uh, spiritual literature, and in particular, a wonderful book called The Road to Immortality, supposedly dictated by uh, the deceased Frederick Myers, the author of the classic book, Human Personality and Its Survival of Bodily Death. Uh, 30 years after he died, dictated a, a book about his experiences in the afterlife to an automatic writer in England, Geraldine Cummins. Uh, and what he reports and what other individuals of, in, in this genre of literature report is uh, often described as seven heavens, that there, there are many other levels uh, beyond. Uh, and I'm wondering, when you talk about the core realm, were, were there different levels uh, within or beyond the core realm itself? Well, yes, as, as I said, my, my sense uh, was that there were several intervening levels that had to do with uh, kind of connections between the Earthworm I view and the Gateway Valley, and also between the Gateway Valley and the core realm. Um, 
I could not begin to put a count on them. It would be several, you know, five, six, seven, I don't know. Uh, but uh, to me, I mean, the important part of my journey was really focused in, in those three main realms. And of course, you'd have to classify kind of the dense uh, uh, four-dimensional space-time of the material realm as a separate realm that to me was visible from that lowest spiritual realm, but one that I saw as separate. But it was bundled together as we ascended to that highest level. So you could easily define four distinct realms in in my experience when you consider my witnessing of the collapse of the four-dimensional space-time. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I could really comment more on that that as to the uh, presence of seven heavens. I would love to read uh, Meyer's, uh, you know, uh, that second work. Uh, I'm I'm familiar with his posthumously uh, published, uh, you know, 1903 book, but not with the later one that was through the automatic writing. And I would love to read that to uh, kind of uh, see my kind of sense of resonance or understanding or if there is any overlap at all with what I consider to be the various levels of heaven that I discerned in my own journey. One of the points that Myers raises in that book is that in some of the higher levels, and I forget which, he talks about group souls. He says that we're all part of larger group souls. They could range from 20 individuals to a thousand, and, and that at one point one becomes aware of the entire group at once. Well, that is a beautiful thought. That would certainly match with some of what I perceived in terms of soul groups. Uh, and soul group is, is a term I, I often use, but I don't define very well. And because in general, I feel uh, that our soul groups can be very large, much larger than you would think at kind of first guess, because I include, for example, in my soul group, people who say before my coma, I might have seen as a nemesis or an enemy. But I came to realize because of my journey that we were just trying to teach each other very near and dear soul lessons that were especially difficult. And that's why we found uh, the others so, uh, you know, kind of challenging. Um, but I, I came to see them as very importantly part of my soul group because those lessons were part of my growth. It was very important and could not be ignored. Um, and so to me, the idea of a soul group uh, rings true in a lot of ways. And I also uh, sense, you know, in reading this literature, uh, kind of uh, broadly reincarnation and, and all those things, seeing these patterns where I think that soul groups reincarnate uh, together, uh, you know, to uh, you might switch roles, parent, child, child, parent. You can flip flop and in a given lifetime. Obviously, our soul doesn't have a gender, so we can come back as masculine and feminine in various uh, degrees of expressions of those masculine and feminine energies in whatever biological uh, subtype we are. Uh, but I think that the notion of a soul group is a very important one. And that, <clears throat> uh, for example, I would say uh, I, I, I love my knowledge of religions has expanded a lot through this experience. I've come to realize, um, as I often say, that you can, you know, whether you want to debate if that presence, that loving presence at the center of all creation that Indy years experience, whether you want to call it God or Brahman, Allah, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, whatever is kind of irrelevant because we're we're all talking about the same thing. And so uh, my notions of religion are really the more they focus on love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness, the more they're true to the deep lessons uh, provided by NDEs. And and that's where I think that that's what I would say is kind of a gold standard to lead us forward. But in many ways, I came to see the Baha'i faith, uh, which I was not familiar with before my coma, although interestingly enough, in that trip to Israel, a few months before my coma, I went to the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa, Israel, one of the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen. And uh, that was a beautiful experience, but I had no idea how the Baha'i faith was really resonating at a deep level with everything my NDE would show me about a universal kind of treatment of religious beliefs that, that center around a loving, infinitely powerful, healing deity, a God force that goes 
goes far beyond that naming, but really is all about love and the healing power of love. And in many ways, that Baha'i faith says that all the great prophets are one. And in many ways, I would say that's another way of saying that is one soul group uh, that is um, uh, crucial to this awakening of humanity, uh, where the various prophets identified by Baha'i faith uh, as uh, being part of this. Now, I'll point out as an interesting aside that to my knowledge, Baha'i faith doesn't have quite as advanced a view of reincarnation as I've come to develop through my knowledge of the work of UVA, uh, you know, Ian Stevenson, Jim Tucker, Jim Matlock, and others. Uh, but otherwise, I would say the Baha'i faith is uh, very much on the money. And I would say that concept of all of the prophets for all the great religions really being members of one soul group, if not the same prophet uh, in different manifestations, I think is much closer to the truth. And that also uh, leads us to realize that although we may think we're on the, on the verge of this tremendous discovery for humanity and the wisening of homo sapiens, but in many ways, humanity has discovered these deep truths of oneness and the binding force of love thousands of years ago. And it's just that our culture at large has struggled and struggled trying to assimilate this profound lesson. And now we're at a point where it's our very survival and existence is dependent on this awakening. And that, I would say, is a gift of modern science, because in many ways, religions have had their thousands of years for prophets and mystics to share these deep truths and for people to approach them through centering prayer and meditation. But I would say that the modern science of consciousness studies, uh, and for those scientists who really want to dig deep, I would recommend uh, the work out of UVA as a starting point and uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, but uh, in particular, uh, Ed Kelly's three books uh, that came out of UVADOPS.org uh, are extremely important for the scientific perspective. And anyone who doubts there is progress being made, just look at the change from Irreducible Mind in 2007, that was Ed Kelly's first book, 800 pages of dense but very informative uh, evidence of non-local consciousness as very real in this world. And then in 2015, his book, Beyond Physicalism, uh, and uh, that mentions my story and many others in the NDE literature. And then, of course, in the spring of 2021, Ed Kelly's third book in, that he edited in this trilogy, uh, Consciousness Unbound. And I provided a cover endorsement for that book because, to me, it's all about advanced spirituality and science strengthening each other. And from my perspective, our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, does that to, in large measure. Uh, and from a scientific perspective, I would say Ed Kelly's three books do it uh, as a magnum opus uh, in that field. Uh, I, I'll point out in the same discussion of the progress in the scientific community that when Karen and I were presenting in 2018 in Belgium, uh, one of the neuroscientists from Stephen Laurie's group uh, put up a slide and made the point that the book Proof of Heaven was published uh, at an incredibly important time. And they said that since that book was published in 2012, the number of scientific papers on NDEs, the annual number of those papers, has gone up fourfold compared to uh, the uh, uh, incidence of such papers on NDEs in the scientific literature before Proof of Heaven for the 32 years before that time point. And uh, it is extraordinary whether I was just lucky to publish at that time or whether Proof of Heaven actually served as a catalyst to help scientific community wake up. Uh, I'm not sure which is the answer, but the bottom line is the world is waking up to this. The scientific community is waking up to this. And sooner or later, the, our uh, culture at large tends to follow the scientific community. And so the fact that the, the religious leaders and spiritual leaders over the last thousands of years have not gotten all of humanity on board uh, to date uh, is not really their fault, uh, and now the universe is trying a far more powerful way. Science, uh, you know, the scientific community might have its uh, frailties and problems, the same as any human community, but the scientific method is very important and is an objective pathway of defining truth. 
And I would say that especially in the scientific study of consciousness, as elaborated especially in those three books from Ed Kelly, but certainly also in other works, and I would like to say our work, Living in a Mindful Universe, is certainly good for the lay public in coming to this knowledge. Uh, I love it how in that Bigelow contest that congratulations to you for your beautiful first place essay, which I think is a masterpiece uh, in in describing this uh, revolution in human thinking. But I'll also point out the second place paper by Pim Van Lommel. He makes an argument towards the one mind at the end of his uh, paper. And in that book, he lists uh, four resources and they're very good. And I think for your audience, they would be very good. One is the book One Mind by Larry Dossie, which was kind of my awakening to that concept in a beautiful way. I think that came out in 2013. Uh, but then also uh, the book uh, Spiritual Science from Stephen Taylor. There's also Pim Van Lommel references a paper by Bernardo Castrop in the uh, in a journal of consciousness studies. I've forgotten exactly the journal, but the paper is entitled uh, 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 The Universe in Consciousness. And then also uh, Pim Van Lommel mentions our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, as another source of the one mind. But I would also say Pim Van Lommel's book, Consciousness Beyond Life, is a beautiful book uh, that elaborates the science uh, that is about the one mind, about primordial consciousness, uh, that God force, that God mind at the core of all that is, with the brain serving as a, a filter, a reducing valve. Uh, that's something we discuss in, in Living in a Mindful Universe as the primordial mind hypothesis. And I would say uh, that our current literature is moving beyond that point very rapidly as we consolidate all this. But the, the point of all that I'm saying now is just that the scientific community is contributing greatly to wisdom and this understanding of oneness and of the binding force of love all through the study of phenomenal human experience, uh, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, etc. And this is where the world has the power to truly awaken. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the uh, advanced work going on in non-locality and post-material science is extremely important. It is the cutting edge of our, our thinking. But as I recall from our discussion earlier, you expressed a lot of concern about technology and how that's pushing us in a different direction. Well, I, certainly the, the kind of uh, ugly underbelly of technology is pushing us in a dangerous direction. But that, again, is why I would say humanity uh, needs to awaken. Uh, I would say it is in our destiny. Now, of course, you can say, uh, wait a minute, what about the rest of humanity? Don't they get a vote? Uh, and certainly if we're looking at the status quo and, and the way the world is headed with climate change and the addiction of fossil fuels and uh, warring conflict and all that, uh, I hope that's not the direction humanity is taking, because to me that looks like planetary suicide. But that's where I do believe that there is truly an awakening going on now. Uh, and things like meditation and centering prayer are the ways that any individual can start to explore consciousness and begin their own journey of scientific exploration. Uh, those are the, that's the exact phrase that Ed Kelly used when he endorsed our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, is that a personal journey of scientific exploration is unfolding. And what he was reflecting on there is the power that any individual has to get on board with this kind of knowledge and understanding through taking on a practice of meditation and centering prayer uh, to dive deep into this exploration of the one mind and, and beyond the limits of kind of the ego mind and our sense of self. Uh, but all of us have the power to do that. And in doing so, growing into the power of this kind of revo revolution and revelation in understanding of ourselves. I believe the purpose for existence of the universe, as is written over the entrance to the temple of the Oracle at Delphi in Greece, know thyself is exactly what each and every one of us is up to. Uh, know thyself. But when you realize that what this modern study of consciousness is revealing in no uncertain terms is that mind, the mental layer of the universe, in many ways is united. Just as the founding fathers of quantum physics, Werner uh, Heisenberg and uh, Erwin Schrodinger and uh, 
Wolfgang Pauli and others so uh, eloquently stated, you can't get beyond consciousness. Consciousness is universal. There is this one mind. And uh, it's really kind of an elaboration of that idea that I think the modern science of consciousness studies is taking by storm to the next level of understanding. And this is one where we truly appreciate uh, that we're not limited by our societal beliefs about you know, where a three and a half pound gelatinous mass sitting between my ears can actually go with its understanding of all of reality, all of eternity, higher dimensional space, every bit of that. But the mental layer of the universe obviously can uh, assimilate, integrate and coordinate a lot more than just our local environs of, of here I am in my body sitting in this uh, physical space around me. But I know through meditation, there is a far grander vistas available and horizons that just disappear as you challenge them. And that's where I think meditation, centering prayer, going within is for each and every one of us going to be an important ingredient. But ultimately, remember that it's the lives we live in these physical bodies, in our interactions with our fellow beings and in our daily consensus reality. That's where we actually get the growth done. And so doing it with that wider knowledge, that higher knowledge uh, gleaned from meditation and from exploration of the mental space uh, simply empowers us as uh, beings who have a presence in the physical space, but obviously are much more than that. And I think that's the reality that all of us can find tremendous liberation is. We are much more than our physical bodies. And our sense of birth to death and nothing more is a limited fiction that is not true. And we can find through exploration of it that we're much grander than that. Evan, what a joy to be with you. I also want to acknowledge you for having inspired me to step up my meditation practice uh, uh, so that I'm now experiencing longer and more regular meditations. That's been a joy. Thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, it's, I consider it a blessing to be with you and to be able to share your thoughts uh, with our viewing audience. What a pleasure. Well, Jeffrey, uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure, too. I always uh, uh, find that I make a lot of progress whenever I talk with you, and I, I just love your insight, your input. And again, I'd like to publicly thank you for what you have done. And those who are not aware, because I know you do not, you're, you're very modest and, and don't talk about it. But the bottom line is the BigelowInstitute.org papers are a revolution in human understanding. There are 29 winning essays there that all support the reality of the afterlife from a scientific perspective. Your essay was number one, and that was a very deserved uh, award. And I congratulate you for that. And I encourage all of your viewers to go read that essay and read the other essays. They all approach it from different lines of inquiry. But there is no doubt in the reality of an afterlife. I think that's crystal clear from those essays. And yours leads the way in making that point. Congratulations on your successful uh, application of more than half a century of work, plus your own personal experience to bring that higher wisdom to the world at large. So from my heart to yours, thank you, Jeffrey, for your gift to the world. Well, thank you, Eben. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.